I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Do we have any uh, adjustments to the agenda? All right. Chair, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the agenda as it stands. So moved. Moved by Vice Chair Rowland, seconded by Commissioner Farinhoff. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, motion carries. Consent agenda. We have March 28th claim vouchers totaling $71,146.39. April 25th. 2023 claim vouchers totaling $79,998.79 and May 16th, 2023 claims totaling $1,418,043.71. Are there any questions, discussions? I'll move to approve. Thank you. Commissioner Teal Flack moves to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second and by Commissioner Lawrence. Sorry, Vice Chair Rowland. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Approval of meeting minutes. April 11, 2023 special meeting and the April 11, 2023 work session. Are those dates correct? Both April 11th? Okay. Surprised. All right. Any correct? Oh, there we go. Thank you. That makes more sense. Uh, any discussion? Vice Chair Roland? Motion to approve the minutes as uh, presented. Is there a second? Vice Chair Roland moves to approve the minutes as presented, and Commissioner Teal Flack seconds. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, motion carries. On to public comment. Do we have anybody online in the gallery? Uh, Melissa, do, Melissa, Melissa, do we have anybody online? Yes. Uh, no, we do not have anybody online. Okay. Do we have somebody in the gallery that'd like to say something? I'm not seeing any hands for public comment. They both sign up. We need to give them a microphone then. There's one right over there. Oh, we have one. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Is working. Can you hear? Uh -huh. Yeah, my name is uh, Riaz Khan. Hi, Riaz. Just so you know, the public comment um, is up to three minutes, and it has to pertain to the RFA. So, my name is Riaz Khan. I live in Makaltio. So, I got elected for uh, board of director for Asian Center in Edmonds. So today I'm here to invite all of you to join this event. This event is going to happen in Edmonds. So you know what, so before I start any further, I want to introduce myself and my friend and the, the director and the founder of this center is Mr. Chen. 
as Commissioner Chang. So thank you so much for putting this whole together, the whole unit. So it's going to help us out, all Asian and non-Asian immigrant, non-immigrants too as well. So this center is all about helping the people who need his help. When I came to America a long time ago, almost like 32 years ago, I'm looking for the help. I couldn't find any help. So I'm very glad, I'm very happy, so surprised to see this center is going to help in many matters, immigration, health, and whatever is needed. Right now, we counseling the students who come from foreign places, they have no idea where to go. They go from one point to another point, another point, they're depressed, they get depressed, they're depressed, they become the victim of homeless. So this program is going to help to avoid, to reduce homelessness services in our county, in our whole country, all over the world. This is the best services we're going to provide. It used to be like Chinese center. Now we made it like broader, made it like Asian now. Now it's also Asian American. It's going to help Americans, as I said, is first come, first serve. We're going to provide service to everyone who need it. So right now, this, see, I think the people lined up to get help. I think we're going to stop everything right now. Since as soon as we start, inaugurated this function on June 3rd, starting 10 to 12, 10 to 1 o'clock. Please join, come. The fort is there. The people will be there and join and make it happen. We look forward to see you again there at their place. If you want to address, the flyer is with us. We can provide to you. Again, thank you so much for having me here tonight. Thanks. Thank you. Did you, Robert, did you want to speak up too? Yes. Okay. Yeah, hi, my name is Robert Ha, and, and I'm one of the founder uh, for the Asian Service Center. I came to Seattle 1976. My parents came in 75 as a refugee from Vietnam and Laos, so I grew up in Southeast Asia. So I encountered all the you know language difficulty. I went to high school, I graduated from Shorewood and you know go through my youth, my middle age. Now I'm uh, over 60. So as you know, even though I speak the language, I know the sport, I learned football and everything, you know. But then still, you know, when it comes to like Medicare, there's a lot of different things that I still have uh, you know have difficulty understand how the system works. So can you imagine a new immigrant? But new immigrants these days are different than the old day refugee to come here, they get help. But mostly, are, most of them are financially uh, stable, but they still have, you know, the barrier. So our tagline is we break the barriers and build bridges. So navigate them to our system. And then so once they settle, and then they can also contribute back to the community. So, you know, we acknowledge them to be involved. You know, Asian mostly are more laid back, you know, or we all like care about our family, but then we want them to know, hey, you know, you are part of the family, then you should, you know, you want to be part of it, you should get involved. So that's why we, we decided to form this. And South uh, King County, they have all kinds of agency, but North, I, I, I grew up in Shoreline, I live in Mill Creek and Everett neighborhood. So it's like, we are underserved. And when we need help, we have to drive all the way to Seattle you know, with the traffic and all that. So that's why, you know, Commissioner Chan, myself and Will Chan, the Edmund City Council member and, and, and Mr. Rich, yeah. Okay, we, we talk and say, hey, we should form one, you know, here up in Snohomish County. So they don't have to go all the way. So for people who are older without transportation, so that's, that's why we form it. We just started and I'm able to, through Commissioner Chan, we work with Shannery then we're gonna have a seminar next week at one of the homage service place. There's a group of 80, 90 Asian uh, members there. So, you know, we, we provide a, a seminar for home safety, fire alarm and all this uh, home safety issue. So I think it's very important. As I get older, I probably need that too as well. So, I mean, hey, America is great. You know, like I came here 17. So, I mean, I, I love it here, you know, it's a, Lots of opportunity, but again, we, you know, we have to give back to the community since we are part of the community. So, yeah, I thank you all, and we encourage all of you to come to our Inaco event. So, thank you again. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Thank, thank you. you. Asian. <laughs> all right, on to the fire chief's report.
Chief Hovis. Uh, good evening, Chair, Commissioners, liaison staff, and uh, guests. Um, commissioners, I've e emailed you an update on our first watch data, and you also have hard copies of my report tonight in front of you. If we could go to the first slide, Commissioners, I want to talk about uh, probationary firefighter Devin Heckard that was featured on Fox Q13 TV uh, and an ideal time to talk about uh, window fall safety information along with the risks that hot weather poses. That aired on May 12th, just in time to uh, provide some additional information to our communities. Next slide. Um, if you haven't received your siren newsletter, commissioners, we have hard copies over by the delicious cake over there for you to take home. But I wanted to uh, thank uh, Ms. Hines for all of her dedicated work and also thank Commissioner Farinahoff for his uh, insights at the Commissioner's Corner. I thought that this is one of the best editions that we've ever done, and I'm proud of it. So thank you. Next slide. Pleased to report, Commissioners, that our volunteer firefighter support recruitment has grown to 26 with uh, two weeks left in the recruitment. So more to follow on that as the recruitment closes up. And uh, vetting is in, in process with some of the applicants already. Thanks, Chris. Uh, another good thing, Fire Corps volunteers, uh, Shauna Ree was mentioned recently, and our group has now grown to 22 Fire Corps volunteers, including 13 new volunteers that onboarded on May 1st. We'll have additional information once pictures are secured and uh, maybe an invite to a future dish with the commission. Okay, next slide, please. Great things uh, that are happening this week. There's going to be three of them um, this Saturday. If you can make it on May 20th from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., we'll be down at downtown Edmonds Fire Station 17 for our Teddy Bear Clinic and EMS Week open house. Uh, a lot of opportunities for people to learn about ACT program and first aid and uh, do some CPR on Teddy Bear Clinic for kids. It's a pretty great event, so don't miss it if you can. Next slide, please. Mr. Uh, ha and Mr. Cond public comments talking about building bridges and breaking down barriers. One of the things we're doing recently is we're going to have an ACT uh, class at Fire Station 15, May 19th, between 5 and 7 p.m. at the request of Linwood City Council and the city to incorporate training in Spanish for our Latinx community. So we're expecting uh, Linwood City Council people to be trained as well as 50 to 100 people from our community. Next slide, please. Academy graduation. So commissioners, you met these recruits not too many months ago, and now they're ready to graduate from the Snohomish County Fire Training Academy. Uh, Muckle Teo is included in that group. So we're going to have the uh, the commencement ceremony and the graduation at Kamiak High School. And that's going to be this Thursday, and it starts at 3 p.m. So don't miss that. And those are the names of the individuals down at the bottom that you met not too long ago. All of them are doing great. We're excited to see them graduate and join operations. And with that, uh, commissioners, this isn't a slide, but just wanted to give an update that staff and the chair met with one of our county council people earlier today and the uh, general staff from another uh, Snohomish County Council member regarding the no fireworks urban growth area zone. And the meeting went well, and we'll uh, be able to report more at our next meeting about those meetings with one still scheduled with an additional county council member. Okay. And I never get tired of talking about Chief Maxwell and his accomplishments because there are many of them in his 27 years that he's been here with us. But I want to let you know that he has been uh, elected for a second term to serve on the International Association of Fire Chiefs EMS Board of Directors. That's at the federal level to talk about legislation committees that, that affect all 50 states. So proud of Sean. And uh, it's a good segue to what is on a slide, which is great news that I want Chief Maxwell to introduce to the board. Chief. Chief, real quick, just want to give a round of applause. Oh. Anything I can do to make you blush a little bit. <laughs> You're doing a fine job too. <laughs> Good already. Oh, All right. All right, now I'll try and remember what I was going to say. Uh, and then this is more about the crews. Um, I, this is just tremendous. I can't express enough. I know that um, commissioners that have been around a little longer know how this has been so important with our history. But if, if you look on the slide, this, 
these are cardiac arrest survival rates. And there's some research to say, if you're good at this, you're probably good at a lot of the other conditions we treat. And um, we've worked really hard at this over the last 10 to 15 years. And if you look um, in the bottom right corner, the these are human life. These are people, their heart had stopped and we're bringing them back to life. That's that's tre That's tremendous in my book. These are real lives. These are real children. Um, that come back and live a full life with their family. And sometimes they're elderly people that get another 10 years of life. These are these are people that have died and we've brought back. And that's what this this number represents. But if you look at uh, in the United States, the, the average here, and this is a national standard of survival, is it's 34% in the United States. The average in Washington State is 38. And here, if you have a cardiac arrest in the regional fire authority you're at 61.5 percent and that takes so much work and i'm so proud it takes it takes a lot of work to know it but but we the people in the streets believe in it and they have the passion you can't force anyone to do us to do to do that level right you can train people and ask them and but you you can't do that unless their heart's in it so i'm just i'm so so proud of our crews um and just everyone in, in the training or EMS divisions that work on that. So I just wanted to take a moment and celebrate that. Um, two other uh, quick things. These are uh, the chief allowed me to give a pre-alert. I think we all know we all are concerned about our hospital wait times, opiate issues, the mental health issues, the navigator issues that we just heard about. We have such a well-established community medic program. We it I think it's starting to kind of hit a zenith in society where there is there are organizations that want to bring us substantial amounts of money to uh, expand our program, and they're willing to pay the full boat. Um, one of the things, since there aren't a lot of mental health workers, um, a program the state started a while ago is community health workers, and that's where you find people in the community, peers in the community, and you hire them to augment the community medic resource staffs. This, this gets our community medics, they're kind of like, the community medics are that, they get there quick, but a lot of times it takes three to four hours with one individual. But what we've, what we've found um, over the last few years, 70%, when the crews call for that community medic, it might take a few hours, but 70% of the time, they can avoid a transport, which means our engines, our ladders, our medics units are in service. It means they're not sitting on the hospital. Uh, walls. And it also means that citizen cut what they needed a better care. So we, in the next month or so, I'll be bringing you, um, people want to pay full freight on, on uh, they want an established agency to, um, to, to hire and supervise these people. They're well, they're willing to pay us the admin, the supervision costs, the full freight. They're, you know, we we just keep doing what we're doing. There aren't a lot of strings attached um, and they want to do it for five years and they don't want to de-escalate the costs like we've ran into before. They want to pay the whole thing. The coal is full freight for five years and it's going to benefit our community. It's going to benefit our, our response times, our wall times, everything. So just a pre-alert, I'm not bringing it to you tonight, but it's really exciting news because our program that we've built over the last 10 to 15 years and the, there's money they want there this is just the beginning they want to bring money to us and they want us to run it because we've shown we can do this and how many positions chief does this fund yeah the may three to five um they really really want to work with us to figure that out even if it means that we have to have more uh funding for supervision sure. or what have you we're not going they they're even saying they would pay when we don't have them while while we're getting it started they they really want they've seen our success and they want to support it and they want to see more of it yeah yes chief maxwell um these community health workers what's their training background education in general so the state built a program it it's a little bit it's a peer support thing um they have a little bit of uh just a tiny bit of everything, like with the mental health, they're, they're navigators in the community. So they're kind of like a step down from our community medics and, and they help, you know, get people into housing, if get people uh, food, get help elderly people get into nursing homes, if that's what they need, whatever, 
you know, our community medic program, we worked with UW for a while. And I think for a while we have a, a book of a, probably a hundred resources of sometimes under tapped community resources people aren't using, they just need to get connected. And so this would, this would be a full force multiplier to our community medic team to get people connected. So they're not calling mental health, social services, going to the hospital, calling 911 when that's not, we're not even really helping them. They just keep calling 911 because we're not their solution, right? Our solution is take them to the hospital that's already full. They need better solutions and so do we. Does that answer your question? No. Okay. <laughs> Chief, if I understand you correctly, um, this, is, uh, this is an unexpected uh, opportunity and it may have probably a, a fairly short suspense. So you'll come back to the board with some, some greater detail here in the future. And we may have to make a decision on behalf of, of this opportunity, but adding these people doesn't add necessarily to, um, to our budget line. Therefore, it's no taxpayer dollars that are being involved. It's already funded by an outside organization. We're just in charge of the care and feeding. So therefore, it's a fairly low risk uh, to the RFA. We're adding civilians that will augment our performance in the field. And this is a value added to the taxpayer that we did not see coming. Um, and as, uh, as you say, we'll reduce our crew time, free them up for opportunities to respond in the field and also extend that, that level of care that we currently do not have, even though we have the CRP and the MSOs. This is kind of that missing link uh, that we've been hoping for, which as you say, is already paid for by another group. So I, I see it's a win-win situation. Right. Yeah. And the, there's more, there's more people needing help coming to us and calling us than we can help. And this helps us help more people, which helps us, which helps the rest of the community. So yes, exactly. Outstanding. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, whichever Richard commissioner. <laughs> yeah. I, that's, I thought you have to be recognized by the chair before you speak. So thank you, chair. Oh. Um, yeah, I do have the question. Remember when we have a, a you know, the annexation with Bothell? Mm -hmm. Remember that one of the members was uh, in the World Port of Seattle, and they would, we comparing the survival rate, right? Yes. Remember that? Yep. It was, <laughs> yep, yep, it, was, I it was terrible, terrible because they, they thought they just in general. And I am glad that. So, how's the condition now be, for, for us compared to the Seattle area? Yeah. So uh, Seattle, um, I don't want to speak for Seattle, but they, they um, due to the pandemic, they haven't published their numbers. They're trying to figure out the nuances of the pandemics really dropped everybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it dropped Seattle. They're, they're still working on their analysis right now. So I don't think they have numbers available right now. Yeah, but I, I'm glad also you brought out so other things that one of our goals, is really not just respond time, right? Is the survival and all that stuff. And we cannot just pass the buck and say, well, it's not our fault, it's emergency room fault. But our goal is here, is really to save everybody as much as we can. And that's why I'm gonna ask you for the, for the dashboard report. We are we'll not only maybe with that is something that we should be incorporating that, we can continue. That is the only way we have a, we have a matrix how do we measure it. I think to me that is really critical. And then I really do not like it here. Say, so, wow, well, no new taxes next year. It's not just taxes. No. If our response time, our survival time go down our way, we have to spend them. Right. But the better way to do it is we have strategically how do we get there before that. So I I will not do not like to see like one one thing, no taxes, no thing. It's not that simple. This is very complex. That's why we uh, all that. I just hope everybody think about it that way, and I'm, I'm glad you bring out all the all the all the problems that challenges we have. Yeah. Thank you. I, I appreciate that, and I I think we can never wait. We can never rest on our laurels and wait for the survival rate to go down before we act. And that's hopefully where the chief and his team were ahead of that in, in informing the commissioners what our needs are to, to not rest on what we've done in the past and hope it just continues. Um, which uh, kind of brings me to a third point. Commissioner Chalflock, did you want to speak first? Yeah, my question was <clears throat> for the cardiac arrest uh, survival rate, uh, is it 
ours higher than national and state because we just give CPR for longer? No, we we have a a tremendous program here. Um, we've thought, uh, as Mr. Peroff said, we should do a demonstration. We we do a highly highly choreographed cardiac resuscitation, mm. um, and yeah, it's hard to even just encapsulate. We we do a lot of high performance medicine. I mean, incidentally, we're down in Seattle. Six counties came together because they want to know how we're doing all of our medicine. We're people are like, we're doing something different here. And it's really the, the high performance program we do, even with an asthma patient or a heart attack, we do things differently, um, which I'd be happy to share more. It's too much, but we, we have an incredible program and everybody really puts their, I'll say their minds into it, their hearts are into it. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. And um, people, like I said, people came, six other counties came together and a few of us went down because they're like, what are you, what are you guys doing different um, at South County Fire? So cool. um, thank you. I'd be happy to give you more sometime or, or, or maybe the chief will have me give more sometime. The, the last thing I'll just say, and this is kind of another pre-alert, just looking at, um, we, you know, we have 375, you know, certified EMTs and paramedics. We are bringing on a lot of new people, you know, 40 to 68 years. We, uh, now it's echoing. All right. Now, okay, now. Anyways, the, the other thing hopefully be bringing to you also in the next few months is looking at how to drive. We have, we still, we've grown so rapidly and things are getting very sophisticated. We have one person in charge of all EMS training of hundreds of people. Uh, our paramedics alone are required to do the, the same amount of annual education as an emergency physician and one person isn't enough. In the past, um, we've survived um, because we've had, we brought in a lot of over, we use a whole cadre of overtime instructors, but with, um, with so much staffing issues, we no longer have, we, we no longer have that standing force of, of overtime instructors anymore to, like I said, we're doing 50 hours every, like all our hundred paramedics require 50 hours a year. Just, that's just one example. There's a lot of certifications, but coming back to you probably in the next month saying, uh, we're going to have to restructure because one person maintaining all of our state certifications and our license, which has to be um, maintained, you know, for all of our transport and Medicare reimbursement, we've got to get that right. And we've got to keep these amazing numbers, um, so just a, a pre-alert that I'll probably be coming back to you, hopefully with some some good um, cost-effective solutions, but we're gonna, we need to do something different. One person for 400, for an organization our side, we can't, we can't train 400 people with one person. It's, and we're, we're hitting a, we, we're just hitting a wall. So I'll come to you with the solution, but hoping for support. So that is what I have. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you had a question. I just wanted to uh, make a comment in, in my other world, we call that span of control, um, maintaining the ability to manage the group below you. And if you can think about how many people did you say? A one to 400. I think that's one to 400. Okay. Your normal span of control is supervision. Supervision is like uh, eight to 10 or something along those lines. So if you look at the scope by which a single individual is trying to manage very complex uh, certifications, having to do all of that uh, kind of uh, monitoring and quality control. Definitely very important that we start dividing that uh, uh, division of labor, get get more help in that corner. So thank you, Chief, for bringing that to our attention. Yeah, thank you. And it used to work. We used to have a standing force of people that would work off duty, and they're all pretty much used for staffing now. And it's same thing with trying to run an EMS Academy after the fire Academy. These all take instructors that we, that's the change. That's the change we're going through right now. So thank you. 
Anyone else? All right. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Chief Maxwell. Thank you, Chief Hovis. Thank you. We are on to the union report with President Moore. Good evening, commissioners. Um, tonight, don't have too much, but uh, just wanted to let you guys know um, we're going to be participating. We're actually working with the Rotary uh, at Linwood. They're doing their sixth annual uh, boxcar derby race that they're going to have down there. And uh, we're going to be uh, uh, making some donations to that and then providing some uh, volunteers to go down and help out with that uh, event down there. So I think that's on June 24th. But uh, and then we'll be looking, hopefully, I believe the I believe the RFA, I believe Sean Ree was contacted on that as well by them. And so I believe uh, uh, hopefully the RFA will be participating along as well with that. But uh, usually a pretty good event. Uh, outside of that, we've got uh, some of our members right now at the uh, um, conference down in Kennewick, and it's a new member conference, basically learning kind of uh, about uh, the union and whatnot and uh, bargaining history and stuff like that. So outside of that, though, not really much to share with you guys, um, you know, as far as anything new that we're up to. But uh, outside of that, happy to be here. And uh, yeah, as always, if you got any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Thank you, President Moore. Anybody have any questions, comments? All right. Thank you, President Moore. On to unfinished business. Uh, Deputy Chief Wells, the Sound Transit Program Overview. Chair, good evening. Commissioners, good evening. Uh, our presentation and update tonight really is in response to the questions that you directed to me in March uh, when I gave you a brief overview of, of the Sound Transit and um, the training that we were doing and preparing for. Um, some of the questions you had really were outside of the scope that um, I deal with since my my focus is training. So I reached out to Randy Harlow, who is the executive project director for uh, Linwood Link Extension for Sound Transit, and asked him if he would come up in and spend some time with the board and update you and uh, be available for questions. So um, we appreciate him uh, spending some time with us and giving us that update. Um, that uh, update I gave you in March, I mentioned that uh, Chief Hovis and I have been working with Director Harlow on uh, a funding agreement that um, addresses training and equipment. And I just wanted to update the board that we've made good progress in that direction um, and that Chief Hovis plans to bring that to this board uh, for review the first week in June, so June 6th. So you'll you'll see that. So um, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Director Harlow to uh, just give us an update on Sound Transit. So thank you for being here. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, yeah, good evening, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you tonight uh, to provide a brief in-person update on the status of the Linwood Link extension. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as Mr. Wells said, my name is Randy Harlow. I'm Sound Transit's Executive Project Director for the Linwood Link Extension uh, within the Department of Design, Engineering, and Construction Management. And uh, my colleague, Tim Braniff, listed here, was unable to attend this evening due to an unexpected family issue. Uh, so as I go through today's presentation, uh, please feel free to interrupt me with questions at any point. Um, along the way, and I'll do my best to answer them. If there are any remote council members, I don't think I saw any, um, but please bear with me and because I don't do well with the virtual raised hand functions and calling them out. Um, next slide, please. Um, so tonight I'll, I'll just be providing a brief overview of Linwood Link and a quick status report on construction progress on the project overall uh, with a focus on the elements within Snohomish County. Next slide, please. Um, although you're likely aware of the Linwood Link scope from uh, the, your previous briefing. Uh, I thought I'd provide a short overview. Uh, Linwood Link is an eight and a half mile extension of our existing one line light rail service, which currently serves Angle Lake to Northgate. Uh, and it will extend from the Northgate Transit Center to Linwood Transit Center. Uh, eventually the two line will provide uh, service from Linwood Transit Center to uh, downtown Redmond. Uh, there are current there are four stations along the Linwood Link extension. Those include the Mount Lake Terrace and Linwood City Center stations in Snohomish County, uh, with provisions for future construction of two additional stations: one at Northeast 130th Street in Seattle, and another at 220th Street Southwest in Mount Lake Terrace. 
Uh, we're currently projecting service to begin in summer or fall of 2024 uh, with daily ridership between 63 and 74,000 across the extension by 2035. Um, I'll put a little asterisk on the bottom there. Um, there our ridership projections have not been uh, updated for post-COVID travel patterns. Uh, so please take these numbers with a little grain of salt. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows our baseline schedule with rail service uh, again projected in the latter part of 2024. Uh, as we sit today, construction is nearing the 85% mark with field work for our systems construction contract well underway. Uh, we're expecting the station finishes at uh, both Snohomish County stations to be completed this fall with the project reopening the rebuilt permanent park and ride at Mount Lake Terrace in time for the community transit service change in September. Uh, next slide, please. I'll pause for dramatic effect and go for the next slide. Um, th this slide includes a graphic that we've used since the early open houses to provide a snapshot of how the construction sequence for our elevated extensions typically proceeds. And as you can see from the list of milestones, things have come a long way despite some of the headwinds we faced uh, between the pandemic's new normal and the concrete strike in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, we've shifted into the third and fourth stages of this graphic, and we're in full swing building the stations, garages, and supporting infrastructure, as well as installing rail and traction power. At this stage, we're nearing completion of most of the physical elements. In the latter half of 2023, uh, we'll see a transition to systems work and testing. Next slide, please. Um, so last May, in close coordination with the State Department of Transportation, we closed each direction of I-5 on successive weekends to remove the false work, the temporary supports from the I-5 overcrossing structure that'll carry our light rail vehicles from the east side of I-5 to the west side. And that's located just north of the transit center at Mount Lake Terrace. We have a long way to go, but getting the structure in was one of the biggest risks that was identified during the planning and design stages of the project. And so I'm pleased that our contractors were able to complete the work safely along the way. Um, and just last month in April, the Linwood parking garage opened to the traveling public. Uh, the 1,670 stall garage adds a net 500 parking stalls to the Linwood Transit Center site and allows the closure of the surface lots so that our civil contractor can complete the landscaping and hardscaping build out uh, around the transit center. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so shifting into some of the things that we're working on currently, uh, this slide shows the different types of rail installation across the extension. Uh, the photograph on the left shows some of the direct fixation track work used on our elevated concrete structures. Uh, in the center, you can see the ballasted track work that's typically used in our at-grade portions of our extensions. Uh, on the right, is one of our double crossover installations. It's the diamond shaped track uh, arrangement that allows our trains to switch tracks from northbound to southbound and vice versa. And there are five of those throughout Linwood Link. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows some of the systems work that currently falls on the critical path for the Linwood Link schedule. Uh, on the left are the overhead catenary system or OCS poles and electrical cables that provide power to the trains once in operation. Uh, these cables that are currently under tension will be energized later this year. The center photograph shows a member of our electrical subcontractors crews installing cabling for the signaling system. That's the system that allows us to detect where, to detect where trains are on the alignment at any time and to activate rail switches. And on the right is a photograph of one of the communications rooms where the fiber optic and copper communications that link our system together are currently being hooked up. Next slide, please. Uh, with this slide, I'm gonna turn the focus a bit to the station sites. The two Snohomish County stations, Mount Lake Terrace shown here on the left and Lidwood City Center shown here on the right are progressing quickly. And as I mentioned earlier, scheduled to have finishes completed later this year. Uh, next slide, please. This schematic shows the Mount Lake Terrace station area in gray superimposed over a site plan of the park and ride lot. The future Gateway Plaza site uh, that's being constructed by the city of Mount Lake Terrace is highlighted in orange, and the existing parking garage is uh, visible in the top right of the screen. 
Uh, Veterans Memorial Park is shown in the lower right, and our current interim park and ride is uh, shown in the bottom center. Bus circulation through this area will be clock uh, clockwise. Next slide, please. So most of the same elements are also visible from this drone shot of the construction site, albeit with north rotated to the top of the screen. Um, this photograph is actually from March because April's photo is uh, was taken on an overcast day and it didn't have this uh, clarity to it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these this slide kind of goes back and forth from one of our early design renderings, and and the next one will show us the current construction progress. This is an aerial view of the station looking southwest. And this slide uh, shows a view of the same station looking directly west, and you can kind of get a feel for the progress of the construction of the station itself. That's 236th Street Southwest in the center of the screen there. Um, next slide, please. Uh, going back to the renderings, this is a layout of the Linwood Transit Center, soon to be city center site uh, at completion. And you can see the garage uh, and station in the center and lower right and the existing transit center bus loop in the upper left, along with the future pedestrian promenade that goes over the daylighted Scriber Creek in the upper right. Next slide, please. And this aerial view gives you a look at the site looking northeast along the guideway uh, with many of the same elements, garage station and bus loop visible. Uh, the tail track extending past the station will serve as the connection point for the future Everett Link extension that's currently in environmental review. Next slide, please. Uh, this rendering shows the station viewed across the HOV lane that becomes 46th Avenue West uh, with the garage to the right of the screen. And the next slide, although the vantage point uh, isn't quite the same, uh, next, oh, sorry, uh, you can see the station kind of taking shape in this photograph with the uh, elevators and escalators uh, visible. Next slide, please. So this slide gives you a feel for a few of the activities that we're looking to finish up over the next couple of months, uh, including the ongoing mechanical and electrical installations, uh, the guideway fire standpipe installation, uh, finalizing the track work, and getting the site restoration, paving, and hardscaping dialed in, along with the signals work that I mentioned earlier. Next slide, please. And and. As the focus shifts to activation of the system, the physical work will shift more into testing and certification, including making sure our train operators are familiar with the new addition to the operating alignment, as well as the runtime with simulated service to ensure that the system is safe for public passengers when we eventually get into revenue service operation. Uh, next slide, please. And that brings me to the end of the presentation today. And, and again, I want to thank you all for the ability to speak to the commission this evening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. All right. Commissioner uh, Lawrence and Commissioner Fernoff. Yes, thank you for that presentation. Uh, I'm very impressed with the construction. I go underneath the uh, the Linwood uh, then Center to get to where I'm going off. And, um, my question has to do with safety. I'm sorry your coworker couldn't make it. And we're in the sense that we would be responding to mayhem on the caused by individuals. And I wouldn't even be asking this question, but this weekend, talking with a neighbor, he's going to go down, pick up his son and daughter in law at the airport. And so, well, why not? go to Northgate on light rail. He says, well, last time we were on it, we were attacked. He says, there's no one there to prevent that. And so is this, is the light rail going to become like community transit, a criminal, a transportation system, a free transportation system for the criminal class? Uh, what's, do you have any idea what's going to make it so people can feel safe to go on this uh, light rail? Or is it going to be just a big boondoggle there that, people paid a lot of money for and just the ripper app are going to be on it harassing people so sir the question that you've raised is one that our board of uh, board of directors has been taking very seriously over the last few months uh, one of the things that we've done is brought on three new security contractors to assist our transit security forces that are uh, roaming the active guideway um hold on, excuse me 
I, yeah. Sorry, well, stop the light. Go on. Well, just so I was going to ask another question, but I want to let you finish. But well, why is it not a revenue service now? Why are they allowing people just to walk on? Because you're going to get people, you know, walk on. Uh, let's see. I'll go cause trouble here. Uh, and that's what's happening. Apparently, it's it's little bizarre that the board that your organization has allowed this to, to happen and yeah, so your your observation does uh harken back a, a few years into the pandemic situation where uh, we ceased collecting fares basically due to the significant drop in ridership um so our fair enforcement and our fair ambassadorship has also been coming back albeit slowly uh, we have gone to a fair ambassador system which um provides a warning prior to um, enforcing a removal from the train, those kinds of things. Um, but we have also been at the direction of our board staffing up our, not just our security forces, but our fair enforcement agents, um, along with providing station agents at the active stations. So although I, I can't say that everything's perfect right now and everything will be great immediately, um, that increase in staff, including both security and fair agents, uh, is expected to have an effect over the coming months and uh, move back toward the expectations of our riders. So no revenue. You're hiring more people for security because it doesn't keep the riffraff off. It's anybody gets on it for free right now. The the system has always operated on uh, what's referred to as the honor system, where we don't have turnstiles enforcing our, our fares like some areas. And that relates to the downtown uh, bus tunnel uh, and some of the early eras of, of our agency. Um, but those fair ambassadors, the fair engagement officers are in collecting ORCA cards, checking fare tickets, looking to increase the number of fares that are collected yes well it sounds pretty insane to me this that this could have even uh, been allowed to develop this way goes along with the insanity that went on down in seattle with chop and all that this what are people thinking here to develop this a huge amount of taxpayer money is going in it's going to be a big waste because honest uh people that want to are concerned about their safety or an uh, occasional person uh, going along there and all the riffraff that you're going to be transporting around. Thanks thanks a lot to your board and everybody else connected with Sound Transit. Thank you, Commissioner Morris. Commissioner Fernahoff, I'm in by Sherwood. Yeah, I just want to thank you for the presentation. It's very thorough and gives us, a, I think, a, a healthy insight on where we stand. The two questions I have are pertaining to your slide 21, which is there's two bullet points, uh, first responder training, and safety certification. I will make the, the leap that you're working with our uh, RFA and neighboring jurisdictions on the, on the first responder training, how to access the elevated platform, working around an energized overhead line, all of that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to add to that, feel free. My I guess my question is on the safety certification. Do we have a role in that, or is that like an NTSB thing where you guys are certified and given the green light to then stop our operating trains? Who, who, who makes that um, blessing for you? Yeah, I'll, I'll tackle the first one first. Sure. Um, Chief Ovis and Chief Wells have done a great job working with us mm -hmm. um, to present kind of some of the needs. And uh, I think as Wells mentioned that uh, be coming with a funding agreement here in the next few, in the next month, few weeks, uh, in order to make that a reality. Mm -hmm. uh, those trainings are expected to start uh, toward the end of this month with uh, kind of an introduction to light rail um, down at one of our uh, OMF facilities in Seattle. Could you and, describe what an OMF is? Sorry, operation and maintenance facility. Thank you very much. Um, I forget that we use so many acronyms. Well, we that yes, <laughs> you're in good company. <laughs> so uh, that, that process is expected to last uh, into some tabletop exercises and drills uh, in early 2024, but kind of the beyond the energization uh, hazards, probably the biggest portion of that is a LRV lift um, to be able to pick up a, an LRV in the event of a situation that requires that. And an LRV is? A light rail vehicle. Thank you. They mean the train. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> um, the uh, safety certification process that you were asking about is one that's mandated by our federal dollars mm -hmm. uh, as they come in. Um, so the FTA requires that we, Federal Transit Administration requires that we um, certify for public safety our, our light rail. They've uh, deputized, if you will, the uh, State Department of Transportation uh, to serve as that state. Uh, it's called the State Safety Oversight Agency, and, and they perform a review of our documentation, our hazard analyses, our uh, plans and procedures to ensure that the public is safe once they're on board uh, our trains, and we can't go into revenue service prior to uh, signature from the State Safety Oversight Officer. So no, no uh, requirement from the jurisdiction with in which the train operates. You don't have a, a sign off, say, for example, from Montlake Terrace or from any other city. It's based on that state certification that allows you to operate. It's our state certification, but part of that certification involves confirmation that the um, responders to an emergency have been trained for light rail related events. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Just trying to map out where we start and stop in our relationship. And it sounds like you know, very good information. I'm delighted. And you said it will be ready by the end of the summer. No, the, I guess that uh, the was stations will thing. be complete by the end of the summer. Thank you very much for your presentation and your attendance today. We appreciate you. Mm, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Roll, and then we'll come back to Commissioner. Well, actually, you covered uh, the answer to my question. Thank you. Right. So, uh, as uh, hold on, Commissioner Kenny hasn't spoken yet. Oh, Mr. Harlow, uh, thank you for your presentation today. For tonight, um, I did want to ask you, can you describe what was the staff recommendation in the media last week to open the link light rail over the uh, something uh, it, it, um, something on the east side? Uh, and can you give us anything current on the uh, area here just to our south here, the 128th Street um, and how and uh, uh, I-5? Uh, I understand is going to end for the Everett extension is going to be a transit center here or a station here. I was wondering if you could just describe a little bit about what the status is related to this area. Okay. Um, so first question related to the East Link starter line. Um, it's a portion of the originally contemplated two line. Uh, the presentation last week at the system expansion committee detailed kind of the status of the review of the feasibility of that um, line opening. Um, it interrelates with Linwood Link primarily because our vehicles necessary to operate Linwood Link at the four minute headways that we'd originally entailed rely on the operation and maintenance facility on the east side uh, for the trains and the issues uh, with construction quality that have been identified across the I 90 bridge will prevent us from access to that. Uh, OMF facility uh, via I-90 for the trains themselves and trucking on a nightly basis to facilitate the service just isn't a viable option. So our, our headways for Linwood Link are expected to be longer. So there'll be eight minutes between trains, most likely. Uh, we're assessing that operability now, but eight minutes instead of four minutes. And then when that full two line opens to downtown Bellevue, Linwood Transit Center uh, can feed to the east side and access that OMF. And that's when we'll kick to the four minute headways that we'd originally promised the, the federal government um, back in the design stage. Um, the recommendation by staff is to continue the feasibility assessment and that we'll be back to our board in October um, to seek their decision, their guidance on whether that East Link starter line should be activated. Um, the other conversation that happened at that meeting included uh, one of our directors asking the staff to also review whether opening a Linwood link first with a uh, starter line plus a downtown Redmond connection uh, would also be feasible. So we've got a, a few homework assignments from our from our board to go through there. Um, let's see, the second question related to Everett Link, which um, I 
I must say I'm I'm poorly equipped to answer. I'm I'm a Linwood Link and try and put the blinders on there. Um, but I do know that the environmental assessment is proceeding. Um, but I tried to bring a little information on Everett Link, but it's not as specific as the question you've asked about 128. Um, I can get back to you or, or have a member of our uh, government community relations staff do so with more specifics um, after the session here. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Lawrence. Yes, um, <clears throat> uh, my anger toward um, the insanity is, is a little hard to contain and I try not to direct it. You know, it's not personal. You're in construction and you're just happen to be the messenger here that the wrong time as far as I'm concerned for me. Um, so I apologize for my anger. The You alluded to some mistakes that were made originally about no, not paying the honor system, which isn't gonna work. The dishonorable are going to just go on and cause disruption. Um, has there been any studies as far as construction costs to actually do it in a way where people have to pay to get on, to get in? Yeah. Uh, I don't know that we've actually gone through the effort of investigating the specific mm -hmm. costs for installation of turnstiles, um, which would be the, the typical approach to fare control in that fashion. Um, I do know that it's very, it was very difficult to install at the beginning, primarily because we were sharing the downtown bus tunnel with buses, which made a fare collection for light rail difficult if you didn't go through the honor system. And now that that honor system was the basis of our design and continues to be, um, that oh, I don't foresee that changing due to the cost. Uh, what you will see with relation to trying to improve enforcement of, of paid fares, you'll see areas called fare paid zones installed in our existing stations. Uh, they're also built into the design for Linwood Link and for the future Everett Link uh, that make it very clear where the line of delineation for uh, expectation of payment is. Uh, it involves signage, uh, card readers, usually quite close to the ticket vending machines, stripes on the ground to delineate where uh, patrons that have paid and haven't paid should be uh, divided. Okay. Um, I imagine the idea is this thing to make, to make a profit or at least sustain the cost of operation uh, with people not, I mean, this, this is, uh, oh, I'm, I'd be surprised how long it before it goes under and something has to be done to make, but what about people on board to pay? Uh, check, you know, your security people, just like the trains and you've seen in movies, they collect the fare when they're on there. So people, I mean, uh, double duty security and collection. I, I apologize for interrupting Commissioner Lawrence. This sounds like kind of a conversation that might be best had at one of their uh, commission meetings. Um, yeah. It doesn't really relate to our our fire service or response time. So well, it um, does because the injuries that are caused, the uh, the mayhem that will cause, we're going to be responding to that mayhem. But, yes, but it's it's fair, fair it's connected. Isn't. So I just uh, okay. I just, well, that, that's for the true. Sake of the that's time true. of the meeting, I just yeah, asked that's it. true. Yeah, I'm I'm a big uh, believer in but... short meetings. So sorry. <laughs> yeah, I I, I, I will also say that I'm I'm poorly versed to address your concerns, um, and I. I'd be happy to put you in contact with some of our staff that could answer in a, in a more direct fashion. I'm simply trying to respond from a construction perspective. And Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Chan, you have a minute? Yeah, when we first started, Chief Rating is the one who came to us is basically the requirement for us to have a letter truck that reached the, uh, the highest point. So is that still a requirement? How does that rescue works and and then like are there any if a train got stuck? I mean it's just like roller coaster in the in the Disneyland, right? So how do you really accurate? I can it? answer that for you if you like. All, all of our aerial ladder trucks will reach the elevated guideways. Still, still, still the same. Yes. There's no change in that. Okay. No, no. Okay. And and basically that's how we're gonna do it using a letter truck to get up or it it depends what the problem is and where it is 
and how close to the station. It, it might make sense actually for our crews to respond to the station and then just come down the tracks. It really depends, um, but we're going to prepare for everything. So, right. um, and, and every situation is different, but. Um, yeah. Okay, but yeah. there's no ladder on, on the structure itself that climb up, right? So, okay. We, we right. do have designated access points that do allow for ladder trucks and and or firefighters with ladders to access the the site uh, more swiftly. Um, so we've we went through that during the early design stages uh, to identify those points, and those are still our our plan to proceed um, for access for emergency responders. Yeah, that, I, yeah that, that's the reason I want to make sure that we still have that. that yeah, I, I would also add that our operations staff is generally um, and typically on on our existing alignment um, involved in any response um, to a light rail incident. We don't we don't leave the emergency responders to deal for themselves, right? We are there in a support capacity uh, primarily um, and to assist with things like technical lifts uh, for light rail vehicles. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't want to have that happen. Is that situation that would be even to crash and you were prepared for it? Our, our train control system is um, pretty, pretty, very, very robust very. um it would take two operators that intentionally want to crash trains together to to make that happen and there are still a few fail safes that would have to fail along the way yeah. over here then. thank you Commissioner Turner, you have more questions? yeah you just mentioned something so it prompted a question this is it sound transit or is it the light rail you have your own response team your own incident response team our operations team yeah. doesn't maintain emergency responders we rely on our partnerships with our, our regional fire authorities or right. um, fire departments in the city's cases to to support mm -hmm. but when uh because of the light rail system involving signal systems and traction power systems and high voltage things that not every fire um, response agency or emergency response agency is uh, well versed in we, we provide individuals at the time of the incident to do things like shut down traction power lock out tag out for those to and are they identified as a team or is it just sort of an ad hoc uh, capability that comes together as needed the individuals are on call okay. uh, at any point in time so it, it depends on who's on staff at that stage they they technically they typically are represented by our our maintainers and our facility staff as well as our, our operations so these are different people from the people that would staff the the security or yes. these kinds of things those are your subcontractors that Correct. just deal with uh, fair enforcement and keep the peace and stuff like that i'm just wondering in the future it's like um in san francisco they had uh, launched the bart uh and i had just ridden the bart train probably 30 minutes before it got stuck in the tunnel underneath the bay and caught fire <laughs> so these are not unusual questions because they've happened in another location so it just kind of makes me think about a unified command who do we have as technical representatives that will come in and advise um you know uh, if we need advice we probably have the answers but you know and and i'm sure that these processes are in are being worked out um i'm projecting based on our relationship with the seattle fire department but i'd expect that incident command um will send a representative at least if not the incident commander to our link control center um mm -hmm. to be able to get a view of the situation from that perspective is that the monitoring station it, it is okay. yeah. very good thank you Anyone else? Just by Cheryl. One last thing. I know that there had been uh, discussions going on. This is probably more for for our staff uh, in regards to funding for training and and that. Um, I don't think covered that. We did cover that. I must have I missed it in the middle of it. Oh. So uh, my my question really was around the uh, continued training and certifications that may be required. Um, is, is that going to be something that's that's regularly kind of just a feedback loop as far as funding is concerned, or is that something where uh, Sound Transit has covered the the initial training and then we're required to re up our certifications and keep everyone trained? The latter is my understanding. Um, I wish my um, 
partner had been here from emergency management to help ad address that particular question. Um, but we we typically do run regional um, drills uh, throughout uh, the course of our certification to help make sure that everyone is continuing to have the up-to-date training on our things like vehicle lifts or technical responses. Um, but typically we don't go about funding on a long-term basis. It's usually the initial run. And then uh, we rely on train the trainer type situations to proceed from there. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. All right. On to bylaws, policies, and special rules of order with Vice Chair Roland. All right. So everyone has the uh, latest copy or the, uh, the, the the copies that are uh, being uh, put before you tonight to uh, to vote on of the bylaws, the uh, special rules of order, and the policies. Um, and so I guess um, uh, almost all of the original concerns that were brought up uh, were were integrated into these. There were a few things that were maybe additions. Uh, that that were looked at and were uh, were not added in uh, simply because they may have been extraneous or kind of edge cases that we can just handle in our normal course of, uh, of business uh, uh, related to attendance taking and things like that. Um, we do have a couple of amendments uh, that after we pass the the bylaws as presented, uh, we can go into and, and talk about and debate. Uh, but uh, we kind of wanted to get the lowest common denominator out of the way and then handle those things as uh, kind of add-ons. So are there any questions? We'll start first with the bylaws. So uh, we're adding what's in yellow here? Um, hold on just a moment. I buried that particular. Um, I believe this is, would be a uh, part of the, um, this is the original language that was in uh, the current bylaws. Um, and I believe it'll be referenced when it comes to the, uh, the, the amendments that are being brought. So this, this right here is what, part of what we currently have adopted, not part of the new bylaws. Uh, we have, I believe it's on page 189, or I'm sorry, 89 and 88 are the amendments that are being proposed. And there's a number one on 90. So, um, for right now, the highlighted language right here will be uh, kind of brought up once we go into consideration of those. But for right now, we're just doing everything that isn't the amendment. So you want to us to pass the bylaws and then we'll hash out the amendments to it? Correct. Why don't we just stick with the bylaws we have and hash out this stuff and then vote on the total completed bylaws. bylaws. There's no rush here to vote on the bylaws. I'm afraid that unpopular uh, things that uh, once it's done well it's well then we got to fight for the amendments and i'd rather hold off on the bylaws the amendments will be passed or will fail to pass tonight they're going to be taken up tonight so it's just merely procedural of let's figure out if we can agree to the the bare minimum and then those things those points of contention where maybe uh there was yeah but this is in there now and i like what's in there now plus it will definitely be taken up here next so the well, first no, thing we're going to do is yeah, but deal what, with the language. Yeah, but, I move that we go ahead and focus on the amendments and then go to the, the lower the reverse order what you're suggesting. We we can definitely do whatever the commission wants to yeah, do. Yeah, I'm going to confuse here. This, the new, the new amendment do not have this, right? The new bylaws, bylaws, bylaws do, do not have bylaws. this language yeah. directly. Right. So let's go on that and then we decide it. Well, that's why I'm arguing against. No, but uh, that's if my we, motion was to do the amendments first. Yes, and then, then do the that makes main sense. Body. That's fine. So the amendments right now are to the policies. We have three different documents here that we have to approve. So again, we're going to start with the bylaws. So these amendments, uh, amendments A1 and A2 are to the bylaws or to the policies, as is amendment B. So uh, the only thing really, uh, I guess we're just taking questions right now on just the bylaws portion of it, which would be page 77 through uh, 80, 81. The majority wishes to do, though. You're pushing an agenda that's contrary to what the majority wishes. I don't think, I, what, what I'm saying is we're, we're passing, we have to pass each document separately, unless we want to package right. them all together. The intent was to pass the bylaws, pass the policies, and once we get to the policies, we can pass the policies with the with that language or without that language. 
however you guys want to do it, it's up to you. I just wanted to try to keep the conversations as uh, focused as possible in each section, as opposed to trying to argue the entirety of it and going back and forth through points across three different documents, just for the sake of you know clarity in our conversation. Um, I, I agree with you. I think you had to define what the media had also wrong. Let's get it done and then we'll give you the amendment separately. Did you guys pass it last year, last week? I wasn't. No, I wasn't nothing no. passed. No. Nothing has passed. It was a special it was a work session, so we can't pass no, I mean, this. No, no. Okay. no, there was some feedback and, and one or two issues that needed to be uh, uh, hashed out. And, that, and out of that feedback came these amendments. I mean, with respect of voting work so hard, I, I would like to. Get the basic done, and then we'll build that moment. You want to make a motion here, you guys? The motion is on the floor. There's a motion on the floor. Yeah. Could you restate the motion? The motion that I made was that we do the amendments, and then we go back to doing the other components. Um, I, I second the amendment. I mean, second the motion. So. I have the same fears as uh, Commissioner Lawrence that once we start deviating from the bylaws that were created some time ago, then we're going to lurch. And so we'd rather take up the do it all tonight and whatever points of contention deal with that the front end instead of the back end. So you'd like to pass policies first with those amendments? Um, we'll go through, yeah, with the amendments and then go back to the bylaws because that, that seems to be the biggest point of contention. That's perfectly fine. So okay. I think that liaison Todd might have had a suggestion. Let's see. Let's see your hand go up earlier. Before we go into you know, the actual, floor, I can't. I can't participate in that motion that's on the floor. So I'm right. Just before we go into actually considering any of this, can we just get open questions done first, and then we can go into debate, and we'll go to the policy for debate first. If that's all right, because these are interrelated documents, I just want to make sure that we're. If there's any questions on the bylaws uh, first, and then policies and that, this, and then we can. This would be because there's no motion on the floor right now to pass anything. Right. This would be cons considered discussion as far as the motion on the floor. Correct. It's not debate. Okay. Discussion. Yeah. Okay. So, are, are there any just open questions on on bylaws uh, uh, to the process to the content? Anything uh, there? To the chair, point of order, I believe you have a motion on the floor to amend, to discuss and amend the policies before you talk about the bylaws. Uh, Vice chair has just asked about anything. I would love to talk about the bylaws, but I think the motion on the floor needs to be dealt with before we can go back to, to talk about the bylaws. So I think we're stuck. At least I'm stuck as far as I've, I have questions and discussion items on the bylaws, but that's not germane to the motion that's on the floor. That is the motion on the floor. So I was with you being the chair of the, the committee, I was looking to you to I can run this portion of the meeting if you'd like. You are the chair. So okay. as far as motions are concerned, that's your your jurisdiction. So okay. <laughs> uh, on to discussion for the motion on the floor. The motion on the floor was made by myself and seconded by Commissioner Fahrenheit or Commissioner Lawrence, sorry, um, to go through the uh, points of contention under the policies and then get to the other items. Is there any further discussion on the motion? All those in favor of pursuing that course of business, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All right, motion carries. So on to the policies. Um, there's Amendment 8.1. What does the commission wish to do with that? Starts on page 88. It says here we have two draft amendments to consider for language to add the policy section B public comment, which currently says. Each person making public comment to the board will be limited to three minutes. The chair may extend the time restriction in the discretion of the chair. The chair may reduce the time allocated for speakers equally. All remarks will be addressed to the board and not to individual commissioners. Commissioner Kidding. Yes, so that language that you just described is what is 
currently in the um, policy section B public comment, uh, sub item one. So the question is, should we add some other language? And <clears throat> so the kind of two alternatives, uh, one created by uh, Rich Davis, which you can see there, Amendment A1, it's very extensive, has lots of different pieces to it. Uh, and then we have A2 on page 89, which is mine, <clears throat> which is shorter. Um, uh, I'm in favor of my version because it's shorter. I think it gets to the essential issues of um, a speaker at uh, public comment, which really is something that we have not had a problem at here historically, either recently or over time, except recently we had, I believe her name was Ms. Lunsford, came here and used some profanity, uh, and that aggravated some people here. Um, but the reality is we have very few people come to public comment. Um, in public comment, sometimes people are going to say stuff that is not polite. Um, we just have to listen. We don't have to engage. Um, it's really the job for the chair to kind of rein them in with, you know, you got three minutes. If it's profanity, it's like, no, nope. oh, hold on, no profanity. And then let them continue. Give them warnings. Use those verbal cues to try and rein them in. It's not about we need a sergeant at arms to throw them out of the building and some dramatic thing or hire police officers or something. <clears throat> we just really haven't had a problem. So when I see that language that Rich Davis wrote, to me, it looks like it is a reaction to Ms. Lunsford coming here. And that is a dynamic that we have, depending on how you look at it, fortunately or unfortunately, the bylaws have gotten very long in response to specific incidents over time. And I occasionally come here and, and, and get questioned about pieces of bylaws and why this and why is it so long? And they tend to be because of particular incidents in the past. So particularly about eight years ago, uh, I think it was 2014 when we adopted this most, the current version that we're changing. And we drafted them at a time in response to the personalities that were on the board at that time uh, and incidents that had happened at that time. But that's almost 10 years ago. The people have changed. The dynamics have changed. And the question for us is, should we change the bylaws? And so the bylaws are as long as they are because of specific incidents. And this mm -hmm. Rich Davis language reminds me of a lot of that drafting from 10 years ago, which is it's a it's a it's a reaction to one person who came here. It creates a lot of procedures. It talks about stripping somebody of the right to come and and speak in front of us when if we were really having a problem with this, um, if you want to see problems, look at the Seattle City Council and how they get treated in public comment. And, and you really got to have it. They are, they're tough. I mean, they got to put up with a lot. We don't have that here. We really fly under the radar, have very little public comment. Occasionally, we're going to need to kind of, you know, just have a little bit of thick skin when somebody's a little uh, rambunctious, um, really need the chair to just step in and, and deal with that. But for the most part, I don't think we need a big, long, so, um, well, that's, that's what I'm you're, getting you're, at. You're, you're, I agree with Jim's that's version here. Getting, fine. For... That's what I'm getting at in A1 versus A2. A2, I think it gets where we need to go with just less language. And here's what I'll conclude with. If we come across a problem where we have a serial um, person that comments in bad ways or un, un, uh, unpolite ways, we can deal with it in the future. It's just like, we don't have the issue now, so yeah. I'm not sure that we really need it. So that's just my two cents on the A1 yeah. versus A2. I can't imagine anyone getting angry at a meeting like this, but it does happen. And uh, but this is satisfactorily. I do have a question because Rich David wasn't here in that particular incident. We saw it. So yeah. was was Rich David being instructed to he watched it to, to, to write that? Or he somebody brought somebody watched, got to tell him he watched it. You watch it on the the, the, re, the replay you, of it. Did you do, do you know that? I mean, yeah, you know, I know that. Yeah, these are recorded so, and put on YouTube. No, no, no. I'm saying that is somebody asked. Yes, we asked Rich to to, to, to somebody did yeah, ask him yeah, to write. Yeah, yeah. To, for that, that to go. Oh, you? Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. But I I think I agree with you. I think one of the things that we really need to be careful. This is a public. This is a public organization. Taxpayer pay for it, and and they have the right to to come in here to, to make comment, of course, politely, uh, whatever that way is. So, um, 
but if we we too much burden, I think is not is is we're taking the right. Thank you. Anyone else? Commissioner Deal Black. Yeah, I agree with uh Jim's amendment. Um if something's too long, it's harder to implement. And um, so I prefer the shorter version. Thanks. Anyone else? Vice Chair Rowan. Is there a motion on the floor currently to pass the, the policies at all? No, we were going through one by one. So right now we're talking about A1 and A2. So is there a motion on the floor for either of them? Not yet. All right. Um, I guess it's kind of weird to, to amend something uh, that isn't on the floor, but uh, for the sake of, of brevity, let's uh, I put forward a motion to amend uh, the proposed uh, policies section of the uh, uh, policies uh, with amendment number A2. Uh, I'll, I'll second that. <laughs> it's been moved by Vice Chair Roland and seconded by Commissioner Penny uh, to go with amendment A2. Is there any further discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Go on to amendment B. Page uh, 90. So as you can see with amendment B, it's radically shorter than section 8.4. And that one amendment B reads more that thou shalt not do this, that, and the other. Um, which is a completely different tone and context um, and totally different look and feel to what section 8.4 is. So I would put a motion on the floor to just keep section 8.4 as it is, um, as amendment B. Second. So it's been moved and seconded that 8.4 maintain its wording and be migrated to the new uh, policies as amendment B. Of which section? How would you like to amend the, the policies to index the uh, We're right here on page 90, amendment B policies. I'm saying in the actual policies document that is being proposed tonight, where, where so would you this like one to put it? says nine, because right? The number nine in the title. Your work product here says number nine. And this is not, it, this just says number nine. So section K, subsection one. All right, thank you. That's all I wanted to check. Commissioner Kenny? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm opposed to the uh, the chair's motion. Um, uh, section 8.4 was drafted about eight years ago uh, in response to a particular commissioner who's uh, no longer with us and set up uh, a bunch of uh, guardrails uh, around that person and particularly his personality. Um, in the, he's no longer on the board and the times have changed, the commissioners have changed and the, um, uh, the size of the board has changed. Um, and I don't know that that is really a treating, the, 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 the bylaws as they change from this large, one large document to these three separate documents. It's an opportunity to uh, reflect on where we are and the people we are uh, and do we really need to uh, treat commissioners um, uh, as though they are troublesome or that they're going to cause problems? Because that's what 8.4 essentially does, puts on very tight guardrails around commissioners and what they can do. Um, and this initially came up in the context of uh, Rich Davis and the attorney and the use of the attorney. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that Commissioner Lawrence on this other issue that we just talked about called Rich, I guess, talked to Rich I Davis I, I and uh, had, had him and spent spent some money on it. And I mean, that's great. Uh, I haven't talked to Rich Davis in two years. I don't really have any reason to talk to him. Um, maybe there's some concern about commissioners, you know, spending money uh, because Rich doesn't talk for free. <laughs> we know that. Um, but, um, but I think that the Having been chair for many, many years, uh, I think that commissioners who may want some legal advice, I encourage them to call Rich Davis and get it. I'd rather have you have legal advice than operate without legal advice. And it really comes up in two two 
two different contexts that I've seen over time. And that is most of the time, the questions that a commissioner might have for Rich Davis relate to um, open public meetings and emails, um, uh, public records, um, campaigning, not in the sense of like advise my political campaign, but rather uh, the use of email as it relates to campaign or uh, shirts that have insignia on them and campaign or riding in a fire truck at a parade and a campaign or writing in the uh, quarterly newsletter and having a campaign coming. So there's this interrelationship that I see around campaigns and the function of commissioners that commissioners have questions on over time. And in the past, that's been abused by the chair in terms of not allowing, I'm not talking about the current chair, but in the past, about the, uh, being able to get that advice. Um, and so to me, that seems odd that we, for good reason, the chief has unending ability to uh, talk with the uh, attorney, and we want him to, we want him to stay legal. And so does our executive assistant to the board. And it seems odd to me that the board members don't enjoy that similar opportunity. Obviously there has to be some break on that. You can't go and ask Rich Davis to, I don't know what his current rate, I know he's said his current rate, 300 plus dollars an hour to research you know, things that you want on your own. Um, but it seems to me that if you'd like some legal advice to keep you out of trouble, that's a good thing for the board. Uh, the other dynamic is that it also is a situation where if the chair is involved in things that are not good and we need to get the uh, the legal involved, you've got the chair then screening that and an inability potentially to then contact the, the attorney. So I kind of seen two things over time with that. And I understand the tension between um, look, we, you can't be your own legal project. You can't have our attorney do that for you. Um, uh, versus do we want to have the commissioners with some freedom to talk to people? Uh, I think at this point in time, as we're changing our bylaws, let's, uh, let's try the freedom route, uh, and see, and we can always change it in the future as opposed to living with the past. Thanks. Commissioner Lawrence. Yeah, um, well, you made sense, or Jim, if you're talking about, uh, um, could there be any automatic, uh, the, the foot drops uh, in this policy is implemented if someone goes off the guardrails, uh, or can there be like a frequent flyer um, um, amendment, the amendment saying, you know, if you have uh, you know, six times a month is too much calling the lawyer uh, or, or budget amount, but, you know, something to, so we don't have to debate over adding an amendment when, if someone goes uh, off the reservation. This section 8.4 not only is just at the attorney, but also the staff and asking them to do extra work without getting it vetted through the chair. Yes, the does that chair. fall under like, That's Part of eight point the present four. board probably isn't going to be doing that, and so we don't need to have it in, Jim. Well, that that's my take on it, and I think that it's in the much more distant past. You know, it was the chair bringing issues to the board about you know, commissioner so and so is doing you know Something <laughs> asking for all this research. A, a, a good example is tasking the executive assistant with tens of projects. I think in the nature of 23 active projects. And it's like, you know, we can't have that. Come on, that's outrageous. Um, but on the other hand, uh, having, having the handcuffs of 8.4, does that make sense? Because it's been argued here in this board, maybe in the last two years, uh, that this restricts your ability to talk to staff at all. Now, it actually doesn't say that, but it's been argued that it has by other commissioners. So I just, it seems like, is this an opportunity to make a make a change from the past potentially? Majority rule. So if you had four commissioners that disagree with the chair, then that would be the, the will of the board. So with anything. So if there's a problem with the chair with regards to 8.4, then four commissioners can decide that well, this topic needs to go uh needs to be pushed forward and the chair for whatever reason is saying no. So this is our if, wrap around. If the chair will put it on the agenda. 
doesn't have to always just be on the agenda. It can also be done under Commissioner Commons so that we've already experienced this kind of year. Maybe. Last year, Roland. I think when, when I was uh, running for this position, one of the things that I did was you know, look at prior board meetings, read prior board meeting minutes, familiarize myself with the history of this. And, and to uh, Commissioner Kenny's uh, uh, point, there was a time where this was a, a large problem and it required something uh, in the bylaws that was very clear to, to get it under control. Um, I don't see that right now. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I have appreciated is the ability for, you know, uh, when I first became a commissioner, uh, I think this was before you even became chair, was our, we, we paid a visit, kind of a field trip to the, uh, the, uh, the maintenance facility and talked to the people that worked there and learned a little bit about what they were doing um, and, you know, had questions that then we could follow up with, with staff and say, hey, you know, we, we learned this, tell me more about it. Um, I think when you get into rules, um, we want to have the freedom to be able to do, get done what we need to get done without unfairly burdening staff. And I don't think we really have that problem now. I think that we have the ability to address it in the future. Um, so I think that the current kind of everything goes through the chair. Um, just the nature of the chair position isn't to be a filter for the board. It's to be someone that coordinates for the board, organizes the board and helps to, you know, run everything smoothly, not someone who, you know, is, is tasked with, you know, determining the direction of the organization. That's our job together. Um, and I think having the tools available um, to, to be able to talk to staff, to engage with the chief, I think we do need to establish some policies and making sure that there is visibility with, with leadership if we're going to go and do that to make sure that, you know, the lines of communication are open uh, and that everything is transparent. Uh, but I think that this is, uh, I, I just think it's overkill. Um, the current motion is to keep 8.4 in. Um, I would say that the alternate, I guess this is the alternate then. Where's, the where's 8.4? Okay. The only reason I ask is because there was A1 and A2, and then we have. There was no B1 oh, and B2. Exactly. So this is B2. Then. Essentially. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I think that. You know, on the merits of uh, engaging the attorney, there is a cost there. I think that Rich Davis is very cognizant of the fact that he is working hours um, and he's been very, you know, straightforward about, you know, being communicative about, you know, his time. Um, I think that, again, there, there are situations, rare situations where having to go to the chair first or tip, tip your hand, so to speak, if there's questions about illegalities or things like that, that, you know, uh, Again, it's, it has nothing to do with our current chair at all, but just in the nature of rules, we don't know who the next chair is. We don't know what the next board is gonna be like after this uh, this election. So I think that um, I always am cautious when, uh, again, putting that filter in place because the power of the chair allows them to start having conversations with staff, conversations with other things to start to, you know, change the, the, the narrative uh, if it's, you know, to their to their uh, to the liking. Whereas the rest of the board doesn't know that this is going on. So, um, I don't think that either of these amendments are necessary right now. Though I do think we need to at least have an understanding from our attorney when a commissioner engages them. If, if he does not believe it's in the purview of you know the the board, if it's something that's outside personal campaign issues. He has the freedom to say no or say, I need to speak with the chair or I need to speak to the board with it. And I think we can trust our, our attorney to, to you know, take care of those situations. Um, so I, I'm definitely in opposition of the, the full filter, um, uh, the old language. Um, uh, so I, I will definitely be voting no on the, the, the current amendment. Um, and if the second one comes up, I can speak more to that. Later. Lawrence. Would it be possible? Is it and and then these um, the amendments or in the policies to have a recommendation convert this uh, to a recommendation? It recommended and ch change the wording because this is a little severe. Commissioner of the board shall not contact request information from request from the RFA attorney, <clears throat> and it's left out the idea of harassing the staff. So we don't, we're not replaced. We, that's totally gone, right? New policies we're going to be voting on doesn't have anything about contacting the staff. This is just about the attorney here. Um, maybe just convert it to a recommendation that just think twice and 
maybe consult before you, you call the attorney. Just some kind of uh, advice versus a strict commandment. You can uh, amend the motion on the floor to what you're suggesting. Well, I couldn't find the words. <laughs> Probably confused me. If, if I may, um, just organize my thoughts here because I, I I think that's a great suggestion. Um, the amendment on the floor would be to uh, substitute uh, of the published amendment B from the packet uh, for the proposed amendment that's on the floor with the change of. Uh, let's see here. I want to make sure I capture this properly. Board uh, commissioners and board members are. Uh, recommended or encouraged there we go we can kind of work on this all together are, are encouraged to um think, you help me out here let's think think this. twice <laughs> and consult with others think before contacting the attorney. To, there we go yeah, we have an attorney present encouraged to consult with the chair before consulting the attorney when possible did you write nine? Did you have you? What do you got, Jim? When you figured out something? When reasonably possible. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Say it again. Um, commissioners and board members are encouraged to consult with the chair prior to engaging the RFA attorney for information, requests for research or advice, when possible or when reasonably possible. Yeah, I'd say to RFA resources because that it's more than just the attorney and consultants and staff. Oh, my my amendment yeah. is just for the attorney yeah. uh, to do to do exactly. the language that I just said with regards to the attorney. Are encouraged to consult the chair prior to engaging the RFA attorney for Request research for advice. Yeah, the the three things that are on okay there. for information. Research, research or, advice. or advice. So I'll just read that back. Uh, commissioners and board members are encouraged to consult with the chair prior to engaging the RFA attorney for information, research, or advice. Okay. So, well, okay. so, yes. so, that, so that's, that's, that I, that's my amendment is that what's on the floor be replaced with that language and that that go in as section uh nine or uh, or subsection nine for uh section k of the policies is there a second second by commissioner lawrence any further discussion on the new language um one of the things that we went over uh, or was maybe discussed when we had our uh special meeting with frank riches yeah with frank uh was that we should move slow and um if we're changing the language I would rather see it like printed out um, before I feel comfortable voting on it personally. And I feel like it's okay to go slow with this. Uh, Commissioner Metter once said like, when we discuss a topic that we should not vote on it that same meeting. So this is kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is kind of the first time we're discussing this specific thing. I think we actually did discuss it briefly in a in an earlier meeting when it was brought up as one of the concerns uh, that was was discussed. Um, I guess the, the purpose of being able to amend things on the floor is to amend them and then get get the job done. Uh, if we if we next week have buyers regret and we think better language, we can always just bring it up at the meeting and we can put it in there. That would be my suggestion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I would probably vote to just keep things with eight point four. That's how I feel. Um, so I guess I'm voting no to the amendment. Okay. So what are we going to vote on? So, uh, my only comment would be, you know, wordsmithing. Uh, now that we have some input, the wordsmithing should go back to the committee. The committee should go and do exactly that, reframe uh, the conversation, bring it back to us so we can have something in front of us. Okay. So... One, two, three. Well, we, we're we looking then to go on a vote now. It's yeah. the motion to amend. Motion right. The motion. Right. Okay. To add the so language we'll, we just talked about. Right. So we need to go to a vote. So then we'll vote on the motion to amend. And then once something has been made there, then that will supersede the 
primary motion. Correct. And then we can then make a separate motion to postpone, which is what Commissioner Keel Black and Fernahoff are suggesting. Is that it's always in order. What? That's always in order. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I that's mentally what I'm thinking about next steps are in the cadence. Um uh, anybody see any problems with what I've outlined? Okay. So the motion on the floor is to amendment to amend the motion to Commissioner Kenny, can you please read it off? What well, you the 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 um sorry, the uh I believe it's the Daniel Lawrence motion to adopt 8.4 as an amendment to the unadopted uh policies is there is now a motion to amend that. Right. Uh um uh sorry by um um to, yeah, it's a motion to amend that to to change it to strike and change to quote commissioners and board members are encouraged to consult with the chair prior to engaging the RFA attorney for information, research, or advice. Thank you. All those in favor of what Commissioner Kenny just quoted, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All right. So eyes have it. So. We are going. So there is no motion. Oh no, we have to go back to the main motion, which is past that language. Is it from the sub motion? So now we've amended it, and now the main motion on the floor is the language as was presented. So we have to vote. So on. we'll vote on that again. That language. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. Two nays. Okay. Now does. One, uh, so we want to make a motion to um, have this go back to the bylaws committee for presentation at the next meeting. Do you want to make a motion to postpone this until the next meeting? It's yeah. data complex. Yeah. I don't. I don't think anything will change between next week and this week. Yeah. So it's up to you guys. What if you want to make that motion? Well, didn't people get up here like make things concrete? Yeah, yep. that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I just okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, since we're doing this kind of backwards, then I would uh, move that we adopt the policies. Uh, where's the official title of it here? I've got too many pages upside down. Do you mind if we uh, go on break? in the near future that's fine yeah yeah can we take a recess real quick so we yeah we'll do a 15 minute break we'll come back at nine o'clock come back at nine o'clock sir thank you commissioner lawrence all right coming back from our break and we will start off with the next order of business which is to pass the uh policy 100.00.014 yeah. governing board and that is on page 82 of our packet so moved. Moved and seconded to pass policy 100.00.014 for the governing board. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Or any further? Yeah, just. Is there any further discussion? Aye. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. Two nays. Okay. On to the special rules of order, starting on page 91. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded, moved by Vice Chair Roland and seconded by Commissioner Kinney. And backstepping, Paul, the previous motion was moved by Vice Chair Roland and seconded by uh, Commissioner Kinney as well. The special rules of order, uh, any discussion? None appearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. On to number three, bylaws on page 77. Is there a motion to approve? <laughs> Commissioner Lawrence makes the motion. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Kenny. Any discussion? Uh, that should yeah. apologize. Yeah. I had yes, that please. question, and it was just maybe a point of order sort of thing. On page 79. Section five agenda about the 
seventh grade reminder says on Friday before any board meeting, board meetings I believe include special meetings and regular meetings. I was wondering if the word regular should have been in front of the word board. <laughs> because if you have a special meeting, the Friday may not be germane to that particular issue. Maybe think, you don't have to worry about that. That was a comment just reading this cold. I thought, oh, that's Friday works with the Tuesday meeting, but if you had a special meeting on a different day, then Friday is not what you really want necessarily. I think your intent was to have enough time for folks to look at it. That was my, that was one comment. I want you to chew on that one for a second. I will say that by, by nature of a special meeting, whenever that's called, that is going to have an agenda with the call to the meeting that by nature of it gets sent out. So it doesn't have a schedule attached to it. It just needs to be sent out uh, ahead of the meeting. So I think this is, first of all, the bylaws are, are you know more like guidelines, like pirate's code. We, we do keep to them, but if there's cases where the board meeting gets moved or things need to move around, it's not going to you know cause uh, you know uh, Mount Rainier to explode. So we, we were trying not to get too technical and, and legalese as, as fun as that would have been probably for our, our resident lawyer. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so yeah. Commissioner King. And, and almost all of our board meetings are on Tuesday. Yeah. There is occasionally we'll have a special meeting on a Saturday, like we had that Saturday retreat meeting, but right. it actually works out that like the meeting coming up with Edmonds, that's on a Tuesday. Uh, it just works out. We almost always have meetings on Tuesday. It's possible that we don't but it certainly encompasses almost all of our meetings. Yeah, and I can't remember exactly where it was here, but at some place it pointed out that there might be occasions when more than three of you would meet in another thing and you explicitly wouldn't be talking business, but that would be noticed as a special meeting. So that's why I was saying by inserting the word regular, you would avoid those, somebody going, you didn't put those out early enough because it's noticed as a special meeting or even an emergency meeting. And with that Friday attachment. So my suggestion is if we're to add, add the word regular before the word board on the Friday before any regular board meeting would seem to fix it. But that's that's fine with me. That was an idea. Second question was electronic. So my, my view of this, but you guys have talked about it more, the bylaws are kind of, here's the bylaws, and then the policies are further refinement of those, and you might have procedures below those. So when I look at section seven, electronic attendance, it says very simply, commissioners, board members may attend meetings electronically. That's true. But I was missing the words that you have to hear and be able to be heard. You've got that in the policies, but it was weird to have to not have that hear and be heard in the bylaws. And Jim may know, I'm not sure if RCW say that or if that's something I've got from me and my council things, but that was always the big deal was you could attend remotely, but you had to be heard and be Yes, and and we feel like it's covered because of the policy, because all yeah. three documents are, um, I'm going to say co-equal. Yeah, we're taking one document and dividing it into three, but that doesn't mean that the policy piece is any less um, important or yeah. valid. Uh, this is, but we did try and strip the bylaws down to the more the bare bones of what the bylaws are, and that's more of a policy about but yes it is true we do need to have that somewhere and one of the requirements is he, uh, hear and be heard yes yeah, yeah. And, and whether or not that's in the rcws it is covered under our parliamentary authority under robert's rules the electronic attendance rules in there do state orally they have to be heard and hear and be heard so thanks yeah we've got it in a couple places so there was a suggestion about i don't know word regular in front of the board for section five yeah, uh, if if there's no objection, I would just uh, um, amend the the, uh, the presented document, uh, the the, the original a, motion as a friendly amendment. Well, I, that's why I said under the old without, bylaws, without without objection, <laughs> without objection. <laughs> um, I, that we insert the word uh, regular board meeting in the sentence that refers to uh, the agenda being mailed out on Friday. Uh, and I am fine with that as making the second, but I believe Commissioner Lawrence made the uh, main. Uh, Oh, the motion. Yes. Are you okay moment. with that change? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the motion makers are good with it. All right. All those in favor of the motion with the gentle, uh, friendly amendment? <laughs> say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All right. Motion carries. 
Thank you for input, Leah and Todd. One last motion. Uh -huh. I move that we dissolve the bylaws committee. Uh, there's been a motion on the floor to dissolve the bylaws committee. Seven. Seconded by Commissioner Teal Flag. <laughs> any, any discussion? Uh, I vote. <laughs> 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 more times. <laughs> we'll be meeting at some public public house then. <laughs> Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. All right. Then. <laughs> Thank carried. you all for bearing with us throughout this entire process, and we're glad we could. Uh, I, I want to thank Jim. He did a lot of the wordsmithing, a lot of the typing, a lot of the work, the hard work. Uh, so uh, I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Again. Um, I need to. <laughs> I need to uh, make an adjustment to the agenda um, under the uh, executive session since it's after nine o'clock. Under executive session, we have collective bargaining. Um, need to uh, like to make a motion to nix that and push it to the uh, next meeting in June, the first meeting in June, our next meeting. What? Thank you. It's been moved and seconded to remove the uh, collective bargaining component of our executive session tonight. Is there any further discussion? We'll have uh, our attorney Dan Swedlow come back um, in June. So, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Thank you, gentlemen. We are now on to the purchase of a 1,500 gallons per minute fire engine for approval tonight with uh, Deputy Chief Curtis and Assistant Chief Eastman. So thanks Chair, board. Um, I think we had a brief conversation about this at the work session and lo and behold, we're back to you um, with regards to um, authorizing the uh, expenditure for um, an additional pumper. Um, just real brief and then I'm gonna have uh, Chief Curtis kind of give you the 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 um, nuts and bolts of of what we're doing, but you all you all know that supply chain issues have been a huge challenge. Um, the pandemic um, for for most of us and and some of the emergency declarations are over, um, but the supply chain issues are not, um, and we continue to have supply chain issues specifically to um, the apparatus we have on order. And I think James will give you a little bit of detail, but the 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 pumpers that we ordered earlier this year. Um, have had a one month delay. And I think the most recently there's a two month delay added onto it. And I think I think in, in the world we live in right now, um, supply chain issues are things that are variable. They change often. Um, staff does our best um, to keep a pulse on them. Um, and I will tell you, that's not an easy task um, because you'll have vendors that will tell you, oh yeah, we can get it to you in 365 days. and and you know, at, at day 180, you're looking at another year on top of that, and then potentially a year and a half on top of that, just because of no fault of anybody. It's just the 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 world we live in today when it comes to supply chain is a challenge. Um, and as a result, um we as staff have had to pivot um and pivot frequently to stay ahead of the curve. And and I, I will tell you, unfortunately, we're probably a little bit on our heels, and that's not normal for us. Um staff. We have a lot of pride in the fact that we stay forward leaning and we've been that way. And, and in this case, um, um, things have been changing fast enough and, and we noticed that supply chain issues happen, but we're, we're getting notified of some of the things with specifically our heavy apparatus. And we find out about it after they've already extended the delivery time. Yes. Yeah, Chief, are we, uh, at the commissioner's, Snow Isle commissioner's meeting a month ago or so, they were talking about ordering the supply chain issue the big manufacturers are actually charging a surcharge you're just about ready to get it maybe and said well it's you know 100 grand more or something has are we been getting any surcharges we haven't yet? gotten that yet but i will tell you the price the price and and a lot of you that have been on for a while and did you know purchase a while ago we were at seven seventy you know seven hundred fifty eight hundred thousand and and fire trucks right now the going rate is about 1.1 and so, so it has affected the cost. Um, and, and like I said, uh, Chief Curtis will um, give you a little bit more detail on that. But I, but I, I, I want to let everybody know, I know, I know Chief Isotel did a lot of work on this last year. And we, we, we were in front of you in June 
to do some updates to the replacement schedule result of what we knew at that time. Um, and, and things have just changed so much. This is not where we are right now in this whole process has not, is not a reflective of our staff or any of the staff that's done the work before. And that's important to know, right? This has just been one of those things that change. Um, and, and we're now in a position where we need to take some action and, um, and we need to be a little bit proactive, um, as a result of when, um, engines come due, we need to be in a position to say, we need to buy it because if you, if you wait three hours, somebody else has purchased it for you because of the, of the state of where we are. Um, and we're in the same, and this is not just fire trucks, ambulances are in the same place, staff vehicles are in the same place. And some of the other stuff that we need, um, to provide the basic functions of, of the service we provide, we're in the same boat. So, um, that has become a, a, a job and of its own. Um, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that, um, we do have a logistic chief now that can actually keep the pulse on along with a couple of others of us who've been doing that because it's, it's that dynamic. And so, um, with that, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the, the, the mic over to, to, um, chief, uh, of Curtis, and he he can give you a, a kind of an overview, um, and hopefully it's just enough information to give you what you need, but not so much information because it's getting late. So with that, Chief, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Commissioners, uh, Board Chair, and uh, Liaison. Um, thank you, uh, Chief Eastman, for that introduction. Um, quite honestly, that's hard to follow because uh, Chief Eastman was very uh, concise and accurate with everything that he says. Um, it's not much more complicated than supply chain issues and prolonged um, build times. But I'd like to start off by recognizing the efforts of our uh, fleet maintenance uh, services division and all of their efforts to keep uh, our fleet and stay ahead of these uh, supply chain issues. Um, our purchasing uh, team and our director and uh, the firefighters that I get to work with on the design team and, and recognize their efforts as well as um, the logistics uh, division um, going out there and reaching out on both sides of the country, we, we have retained a, a consultant on the East Coast as well as the West Coast looking for used pumpers. We thought that a used pumper would be a good option to bring forward. Um, that hasn't necessarily transpired as well as we had hoped. Um, we've had some uh, leads that have disappeared um, at a moment's notice, and we've uh, been, as my daughter would say, been ghosted on uh, phone calls. Um, so that told us that somebody else uh, purchased it. Uh, we've exhausted a lot of our avenues as we've uh, searched um, for at least two and a half months since I've been in the division, if not longer prior to me with Chief Isotalo and, and his team. Um, we're, we're not able to turn up anything. So that led us to, okay, what's what's plan B? And plan B is, is there anything on the lot that we can buy that's a new pumper um, in the sense that you would go to a dealership and say, I want to purchase this fire engine. Those aren't options either. Those are snatched up just as quick as you, you find them in these magazines, these trade journals that show up. That's old news. That, that's not accurate. So then that pushed us into the form of in-production um, pumpers, and, and they're called production pumpers. This, there's a handful of rigs that we're considering right now. Um, for asking for your consideration uh, to approve as we are seeing pumpers come off the line and they are being purchased before they are, they are even finished. Um, one story that I like to tell is a, a dealership in uh, Texas that was uh, proactive and they made a purchase of 21 pumpers. My understanding is not a single one of those pumpers hit the dealership lot before they were all purchased. And this happens to be one of those stock uh, that we are focused in on. We didn't want to identify one in particular. We wanted to bring forward a couple options as, as the dynamics are continuously changing. So we're asking for your general approval as we dial this in and determine exactly which pumper meets the needs of South County Fire to help shore up our fleet and uh, keep, keep us ahead of it versus reacting to um, the situation. So our Vice Chair Roland and then um, Lawrence. Just a context question. We have two emails here. Page 95 references six yeah. different job numbers. Sorry. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, which is the motion that you're, or the recommendation that you're bringing to the floor tonight for one of those, or are these three different options for that one problem? Uh, 
we actually have several different options for the one problem. We're asking you tonight for your consideration to approve $1.2 million uh, to uh, cover purchasing uh, of the apparatus, uh, taxing and delivery, and any changes to that uh, vehicle that we might need to de deal with um, at a dealership level. These are used as examples to show you um, uh, two uh, co comparable brands. Um, one specifically is uh, Pierce, which is uh, very prominent in our fleet. And the other one is Spartan, which is also just as uh, uh, relevant in our fleet. Those are two um, comparable pieces of equipment. Uh, the, the idea was that we would bring you uh, that forward for um, just to add context to the conversation tonight. Gotcha. Commissioner Rowan, did I answer your question? Yes. Uh, this, the second real quick question is, yes. um, so we have to move fast on this. So instead of waiting till you find the one that you want and coming to us for approval on that particular model, you want the, the highest amount and then leeway to, to do what you need to do. Yes, sir. We are asking for pre-authorization up to $1.2 million. Um, that gives us the flexibility to make a decision without having to come back to the board and risk losing that purchase in that time frame. Any other questions? Those were my two. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Commissioner yeah. Lawrence. So uh, going forward until things change with the supply issue, um, <clears throat> this might be a regular thing that we need to pre-approve the funds so you can snatch whatever deal comes along. Yes, sir. I would defer that to Chief uh, Eastman has a better pulse on that than I do. So I think I think we are in that position. Um, I, I think this is this is this is the first step, and and I would anticipate um, we kind of are in the same boat with just, just staff vehicles, command vehicles, the the BC rigs. Um, the challenge is the state pool comes out. And by the time you get approval to buy, the next thing you know, there's no vehicles left on state pool because they're they're limited. So I, I think we are in at least for some of the major things that we do. Um, we're still trying to get our arms around that whole big picture, but I do think um in this position for a while, we've been working with CFO Bothwell um to make sure that as we go down this path, um, because I think it I think you're correct. I don't think this is a one-off. I think we we probably need to anticipate doing this at least for a while. And how do we do that to make sure, um, you know, there's auditor issues and stuff and, and, and CFO Botham has been part of this discussion um, to make sure that the next time we come, I don't know if there's additional um, things that, that the CFO will bring for the temporary thing we're doing. We're still working through that piece in totality. Um, at the end of the day, but yeah, I do think we're in this in this place for a little while. Do we? Are you? Do you need permission from the board for purchase of staff cars and the lower cost items? Or that's just you just go ahead and buy it without. You don't need our. We group. we historically come back before the board, and the and here's the reason is because if you if you remember what we adopted in the budget, I think we adopted the in the budget was between eight and ten, um, either either staff vehicles or or you know, command vehicles in the street, which when you add those dollars and cents up, it becomes a significant amount of money. So because we they're budgeted, <laughs> we historically bring that forward. And I think you're gonna see us ask- Preemptive. Preemptively, and, and, here's, and here's the other thing. I don't think we can tell you exactly what we're buying yet because we don't know the quantities and what's okay. available. Right. And, and James and the rest of the team need to be, the, the challenge is, is you know, we, we typically have Fords. We use the Ford intercepts. We use Ford, you know, we stay in the Ford range. The problem is we may not be able to get Fords and we may have to pivot. Um, and we need to be able to do that quickly. So I think we'll see something with staff vehicles come quickly um, after this for the in, in the same same contents. We're looking at, um, you know, up to this amount of money for the staff vehicles that have been budgeted um, and get it ahead and then go do it and then tell you what we did and bring the, and, and do it. A little bit Thank you. Commissioner that good. Okay. Commissioner Fernhoff, you had a question? Yeah, I um thank you for bringing this to the board's attention. And uh, and I think uh, Chief Eastman, you just used a very uh, important word, and that is pivot. We need to give you as staff the flexibility to be dynamic, 
uh, to have a competitive posture, especially when you're competing for these resources. So as, as far as I can tell, I, I would be very much in favor of this. Um, and there is, a, there is a point in your discussion here, and that is that the uh, city of Linwood fleet manager, Lauren, has also asked for a reevaluation on those two apparatus that are going to go into uh, refurbishment, I think it is, in lieu, in lieu of doing that. We need to reposture the money, if I understand the argument correctly, so you can be prepared. Um, we have an aging fleet. Uh, we know that there are delays in delivery, which are going to impact our services, impact our ability to support the public. And so, uh, and this also, uh, by gaining new apparatus, allows us then to have a reserve fleet that we can replace those engines when they do need to go into the shop. We have additional apparatus. So. I, I just as this is presented in in this format, I would I would say I'm in favor. Of it. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Kenny. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief Curtis. Um, as part of your um, consideration of this issue, are you in some ways indicating that you are willing to move off of the Pierce brand for pumpers? Um, yes, sir. We are considering all options available to South County Fire at this time. Um, if, if I can elaborate a little bit, um, our team has traveled to uh, trade shows to have conversations with uh, vendors and manufacturers. And we have looked at, uh, there's, there's, we'll say the big five. We've looked at those uh, manufacturers to see what they can offer for us. And, and the, the messaging is very consistent, 24 months turnaround time. Um, if I can add to this conversation, we do have some pumpers on order um, that the board has approved previously. And the first one is slated for delivery in May of 2024. So that, that gives some context to what we're talking about and the challenges that we are facing. And we are right now open to um, reasonable, dependable solutions um, that work for South County Fire. And our people. So the, the reason that I ask is that there's been in the past we have um I don't know if that's it's certainly been a staff recommendation. I don't want to say it's a policy or more of a just a custom that in the last number of years we've gone exclusively to pumper, yeah. pump pierce, pumper, uh pierce uh equipment uh, trucks. And so this is a step away from that, but it's because of the inability to get anything. So Pierce builds a terrific product. They have been very good for South County Fire. Uh, we've also had a very good relationship with uh, Spartan in the past and E1 and other manufacturers. We've been very fortunate to have great relationships. With but but it, it, if you can't get the uh, the um, the Pierce pumpers or the Pierce trucks, then you got to look elsewhere. So yes, sir. yeah. That so Commissioner Kenny, I think I think it it doesn't it doesn't take away from the work we did and and why we're with Pierce. It's just we're at a spot we're waiting. 24 to now 29 months for a pumper where we're we're at a spot where we you know i think i think if all things were perfect we'd be buying peers right we'd be going down the same path we were um and the challenge is is like you said i think in this current window of time they're not an option we've got three on order they're still on order we don't plan on canceling those orders um and and hopefully this turns around and we go back to doing whatever what we were doing but we are in a spot where the direction the direction given to james was go find us three engines go find three engines type one pumpers um that will will meet the needs that this organization has today and and part of this is is um you know we talk about the shop a lot and 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 i i guess i want to make this clear to everybody because i don't think we've said it is we haven't we, we've kind of set the linwood shop up because we don't have because the supply and chain issues have been such that I've got an engine that's sitting in the shop waiting for a radiator. It's been there for over two months. That's not that's not Lauren's problem. And it's not Linwood Shop's problem. The challenge is though is now I have a new pumper out needing a, a radiator, and I don't have enough reserves mm -hmm. to actually allow that engine to be out. And what ends up happening is is we have, in you know our our aging fleet, they need a little bit more time in the shop for major pms as they get older and what's happening is is because i need those engines operationally lauren can't do the work that he would normally do if we had enough fleet to do it and so what's happening is is and i want to make sure people realize that the shop's doing great work for us we don't have enough engines 
now as a result of what we're doing and the fact that we've got one um, getting refurbished that hasn't come back yet that we thought was going to come back four months ago and some some of the best laid plans that we had haven't actually come to come to fruition is is Lauren's doing the best he can to make sure we've got 15 engines that are in the street first two and then dealing with the, the supply chain issues and all that and and really we need about three more engines in the reserve side of the house to help manage all the other challenges we've had that include some of the supply chain issues so um I, I guess I want everybody to know Lauren and his team are doing fantastic work we've handicapped them because I don't have enough engines to let them take an engine out long enough to do the the more extended and maintenance that they're required to do because of the age of our fleet. And so what he does is he spins them around quick, gets them back to the company, right? And and you guys know what that happens. It cascades. <laughs> and 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 so um, like I said, Chief and I looked at James and said, we need three fire engines, go find them for the problems that we're having. And it, it's a lot to do with the current supply chain issues. Um, and we need to get ahead of the curve and get back forward leaning. So I, I wanted to add that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think once again to give credit to the shop, um, Lauren has, and I know for for Commissioner Kenny and, and Commissioner Chan will know, um, District Seven with them had a mobile 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 truck that did mechanic work. Um, Lauren actually has done the same. He's he's got the ability to do mobile work now, um, and and has made some changes to their service delivery to maybe help us a little bit and be able to go with a mobile truck to stations and do some work um, to help us. Um, and there's other things there. There's, there's a benefit for the organization of our size. When we have greater alarm fires, you know, Lauren will be able to use that resource and actually be dispatched to the fire. So we can have our mechanics there on, on second, third and fourth alarm events to maintain our fleet during the emergency response at the same time. So, um, but once again, Credit to credit to Lauren and his team and 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 once again forward leaning, um, put something in place that quite frankly he didn't have to um, to help solve our problem um, um, in the short term and 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 I I guess that's important for you to make sure you know this isn't a shop issue this is a conglomerate of a lot of things and Linwood has been fantastic they continue to be fantastic and they're great partners um, in maintaining our fleet and I think I, I want to make sure the board knows. At least Chief and I, I, I can think I can speak for James, are very, very happy with what they're doing based on the challenges we're giving them. Great. Thank you. Vice Chair Rowan. So this is for one. You guys have been talking about needing three. Which is it? What's the time frame here between the one and the three? Uh, that's question number one. Yes, sir. The uh, first um, pumpers can be available um, by midsummer. Uh, delivery to South County Fire. Uh, we have some options to see if there's others on the assembly line, but that hasn't necessarily uh, firmed up yet that I was comfortable to bring that proposal forward. We wanted to feel the pulse and then uh, Chief Eastman could probably have. So there's one available right, right now. now. Yes, sir. Which, which one is that uh, out of these options? Uh, the, the specific one. one. Point two, the, the, the highest? The no, 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 sir. The, the one that we're looking at that's available right now is the uh, Spartan uh, model 3114, which is uh, called an S180 and it's a Spartan. Which job number? Or kind of it's gonna number. be the uh, colored one. Uh, this is gonna be page number 98 of 125. Well, I'm not talking about the picture. I'm talking about the, the first emails. You had three different options there in different price ranges. You're coming to ask for the 1.2 million. So I'm assuming the Spartan is in that third Dollar sign will be pushing yes. one million. Yes, sir. This is going to be the page ninety-seven of one twenty-five, and it's a uh, priced at eight thirty-five six hundred before delivery cost and taxes. So why are you asking for one point two million when we've already got a price that just in case by the time tonight's over, it's gone? You still have options. Yes, sir. Uh, twofold. Um, if we are able to get this uh, particular pumper, we anticipate the tax delivery cost. Um, we anticipate that there's going to uh, have to be some modifications to meet our fleet um, and, and agency expectations. Um, the chiefs were uh, kind enough to suggest that number to offer flexibility. So you think 300000 extra for the tax and whatnot? Yes, sir. Okay. So, um, let me... 
That's that's a good one for now. Commissioner Pernhoff and then Commissioner Lawrence. Okay. I just have it. I'll come. Well, if, if you don't mind. So, so to answer your question, we do need three. Um, the, 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 the nice thing about the, what's in front of you right now is it doesn't need any changes to the budget, right? The, the dollars and cents are there. If we go to the other two, there's, if I can interrupt you for the sake of time, just given what we have left on the agenda, let's just focus on the one for right now so we can get through this. Cause we've got two more budgetary things that we got to go through that probably are going to get first, but plus the uh, executive segments. So, um, uh, my last question is you, you said, um, you need to move quickly if this one goes away what's your definition of quickly on these things less than seven days i'm yes. assuming less than four days yes like literally the day tomorrow morning. and it's gone tomorrow tomorrow morning okay thank you good turn off uh, pending any other discussion i make a motion to approve uh, we have second motion all right it's been moved and seconded to uh let's see here the wording is authorized fire chief to purchase to sign a purchase agreement for one new stock production 1500 gallon per minute fire engine pumper through a cooperative purchasing agreement such as HGAC or Sourcewell totaling up to $1.2 million. And it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Vice Chair Roland? One last thing. Um, so this is the anticipation that we'll have this by summer. So this is like a quick turnaround. This isn't going to be we off we we do one point two million and then you can't find something and then you order something that's two years down the road that's kind of out of this you come back to us with something. Like in that. this instance, the buyer backed out. Is that what, correct? Okay. This particular instance, yes. Right. Great. That's all I need to know. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners. Well, we're going you. on to the next thing. Okay. With all respect, a lot. <laughs> Microsoft Office 365 contract renewal for approval with IT manager Groenveld and procurement contracts administrator Jensen. Cool. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, just bringing forward to you two items, but we'll start with the first one that you just mentioned. Uh, our Office 365, which is our email system, an online storage platform, is due for annual renewal. The item that's in front of you right now for approval is budgeted. It's all part of the original budget process, but because of the bylaws that are or the RCWs that are in place, anything over seventy-five thousand dollars are required for board approval. Um, so that is what we are looking for at this point. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Commissioner, very quickly. Um, so this covers licenses for all of the. Uh, firefighters, EMS, internal staff. Is there a reason that we are doing full E3 licenses, which include desktop applications for people that don't have desktop computers? So the main reason for that at this point is because we actually are entered, we're in a current contract with Microsoft. So technically this is actually an annual renewal that we are in. All that stuff was in place prior to my time coming here. Our systems are currently set up where we don't have enterprise office licensing for the desktops. All of our desktops have the Office 365 apps on it, and they are being used by all of the staff at this point. So in order to change that structure, it would require us removing those apps from the computers and changing our licensing model. The way we are now, yes, it's a per user seat. So the user who's using the computer, their license allows them to use those Office apps. So to answer your question, the reason is that's how it was laid out in the beginning here. In the future, when the contract comes up for renewal, it's definitely something that we would we we can look at and we will be looking at um, to see if there's a better option out there. Yeah, that bring I'm bringing a little bit of my day job with uh, no, it's on good. this one, but I've, I've done consulting specifically on licensing to fire departments uh, in other states. And uh, one of the things we always looked at is the fact that most people don't need those desktop apps. The savings are about half the price. So you're talking about 90, 80 to 90% of your staff not needing that and being able to cut that back would be a significant cost savings. So um, uh, given probably the, the late date, um, I'm, I'm not gonna create a big fuss now, but uh, if, I'm, if I'm here the next time this thing comes around, um, I would like to see uh, you know, a realistic way that we can actually address these with 
you know, the licensing that they need as opposed to the licensing that Microsoft would love to, you know, charge them for that they're not using. Sure. And, and just to add to that real quick, just so uh, this is the second year of a three-year contract we're currently in. They have very limited things that you can change on the contract. One of them is downgrading the license type. So the time that we would really be able to do that is actually going to be 2025 at this point. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Any other discussion? All right. Uh, here I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the contract annual payment for the Microsoft Office 365 services for $130,193. So moved. Second moved by Commissioner Kenny, seconded by Commissioner Fernhoff. Any further discussion? Not appearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Uh, real quickly, a house cleaning item. Um, that was just the first one. Got that, oh, you got two. Unless you wanted to bundle them both in there. <laughs> no, what's the other one? The second one is actually for the routine annual or routine replacement of our current server infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's in our data center in Linwood. Um, all this stuff is up on the end of its uh, current warranty cycle. And we're looking to upgrade those systems to better plan for the future and get them all under warranty and allow us the proper time to actually do a migration project to the new hardware. So uh, this will be a direct replacement of the two physical servers that we have, as well as the data storage that goes along with that. For redundancy, we are also adding in that was also accounted for in the budget to add uh, additional redundant switches uh, in the data center to allow for some more just redundancy to allow for failures and to try and limit downtime when we're doing routine updates. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pernahoff, you have a question? Yeah, just a real quick question. Um, you say we're at end of life on these or warranty? We are currently at end of warranty and we're pretty much maxed out on resources. We don't really have room for growth at this How point. How long they've been in service? Uh, f this is the fifth year of service for them. And our new hardware will be uh, presumably more robust, contemporary, and may have more storage and more capability than our current backbone does? Yeah, the hardware that we've gotten, it has enough plus enough what we think we're going to be doing in the next five years or so, but we've also made sure that the hardware we are getting has the ability to be upgraded to allow for unexpected growth by adding just additional resources like hardware and or hard drives and memory and that kind of thing. That's a great answer. That's where I was going for expansion and, and yep. the next five, 10 years or whatever the serviceability is. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? All right, Chair, would entertain a motion to, for the board approval of contracts, purchase two servers, one storage appliance, and two switches for $93,466. So moved. Moved Second. by Commissioner Kenny, seconded by Commissioner Fernahoff. Any further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Nice job. Uh, one house cleaning item. The uh, Our... Uh, Purchasing and contract policy is the RFA requires that contracts purchase goods or servers a value of seventy-five thousand or greater must be approved by the board of commissioners. Approval is required irrespective of whether purchase included in the adopted budget. Um, so, do for these items, just point of clarification, do we want to continue to have these as new business items, even though that they were part of the approved budget and could easily slide into the consent agenda, or Keep um, because of their dollar amount, keep them on the new uh, business. It's a question to the commissioners. So we can see the rule of how often they just come up every five years? At least annually, but these were ultimately these were items that were already accepted on the budget. And so in theory, we could just put these on the consent agenda and simply pass them. But I felt that because of the dollar amount, that there might be some discussion that the commissioners wanted to have. And so that's why I pulled them off the consent agenda and put them in new business. So, Commissioner Kenny? Well, my personal preference is to leave them on the main agenda. I think seeing them is helpful, I think, for commissioners to know big ticket items that we are purchasing. And I know it takes a little bit of time. This hasn't taken a lot of time, uh, but it does raise a question for me that I didn't raise here in the interest of time um, that I'm going to follow up with Mr. Gunveld separately. Um, and I think it's just helpful to see that from time to time. Okay. So that's my personal opinion. 
All right, looks like the consensus is just that. So thank you, that's all I was fishing for, thank you. On to committee updates, bylaws with Commissioner Rowland. All right, sure. Done. There's all no bylaws. Dissolved. There's no bylaws. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, that's why finance. I made that motion earlier. <laughs> finance committee with uh, Commissioner Chan. Oh, we're going to have a mixed meeting on, uh, on, on next, next month. Okay. I'm working with the CFO, uh, what, what Jen will be doing. Not a Thank you. Uh, intergovernment, intergovernmental with Commissioner Fernhoff. No significant updates since our uh, last meeting. Easy for me to say. Uh, still not one. We had a finance committee last week, and we have a general board meeting on Thursday. So I don't have any updates at this point in time. On to Commissioner Comments. I am. Mm. Oh, okay. Commissioner Bernahoff and then Commissioner Chan. Oh, no. Commissioner Chan. For okay, Commissioner Chan. Oh, 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 you go. Yes, I spend that 20 minutes. I was going to go. Your first. mic is off. Uh, your mic is off, Commissioner Chan. Yeah, I, I just wondering when when we will have our uh, the uh, dashboard report for discussions. And... So, um, I know Jennifer's from working with Chris. She um, she had a, a a slight data connection issue that they're working through. Um, I've got a meeting with her tomorrow. I think um, Chris, to his credit, I think they've resolved it. Um, but I need to know from a, from Jennifer because the break was significant enough where I couldn't update it with the current data. So um, I don't. I, I, she's ready to go if the data connection works to put it together and. Um, we can get that to you soon, but I I I, I want to under promise and over deliver. So I need to find out from Jennifer tomorrow if um if she had that glitch fixed. Um, if she did, then we'll be able to move forward quickly, and you will see that um, in the very near future. Yeah, but I, since our discussion is important, I think I appreciate uh, Chief uh, Maxwell when you talk about all the other data we should know. And I, another thing I really want to think about is the deployment. We haven't talked about deployment for a long, long time. Maybe that that will help me. And second thing is I would just want to say that I'm happy to get people reporting about uh, Asian Service Center. Actually, that is by coincidence, you the you're going through the the same uh Sean to do the do the the Tino thing. We we gotta think about that. I think. No matter what it is, these people are taxpayers, either through their own property or their rent. So because they have a problem to getting our service, that there's a great way to reach out. But also it's for our own good, right? Like the home state, that will help us to get them to be safe in the home, one less call. So we, I, I appreciate, and I understand this organization really working for, for the benefit of us and other city council. So uh, thank you for your support. Thank you, Commissioner Jan, Commissioner Fernhoff. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank everybody who's been watching this evening and also just extend thanks, even though they're not here. Uh, Chief Wells, uh, in particular, for being attentive and responding to the board's need and bringing in uh, Mr. Harlow to discuss our sound transit. I thought that was very valuable. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Penny Coyne for your mm -hmm. show of support and yes. Max this evening and a wonderful cake. Also, Chief Maxwell, just want to call you out back there, I see you hiding, just excellent leadership. Um, you know, you've distinguished the RF, RFA on a national level, which cannot, you know, there's not enough awards uh, that we can give you and your dedication and inconsistent, passionate drive really inspires everybody, you know, here. And um, just, uh, yeah, and thanks to Chief Curtis. Chief Curtis, I, I, I have a notation down here that you're going to keep us rolling. So thank you so much for, for all you do. And and thanks to all staff. Vice Chair Rowland. Um, I just want to thank the other commissioners. I know last week I uh, made a motion to uh, kind of cut something short that was getting off track and I did it again tonight. And I'm, I don't want to step on people's toes, but I think we can all self police. I want to appreciate, uh, you know, um, you know, you allowing me to do to do that when, oh, yeah. when I decided to jump out and, I and put myself I, I in the, uh, the way of the train. <laughs> no, I needed to one of these times that. I'll get run over, but uh, <laughs> thank you. Commissioner, uh, thank you, Commissioner Fernhoff and Commissioner uh, Rowan. I echo what you guys have said and I appreciate that. So we will now go into executive session. Uh, 
topics being a uh, potential litigation pursuant to RCW 42.30.11 sub 1 sub I and review of the performance of a public employee pursuant to RCW 42.30.111 G for uh, 30 minutes and potential action um, afterwards. The executive session has been extended until 10.30. The executive session has been extended until 1040. The executive session has been extended until 1045. I call the meeting back to order and I stand at rest until we have a quorum. All right, we reached quorum. Uh, the chair entertains a motion to accept the memorandum of the chief's goals for 2023. So moved. Um, seconded by Vice Chair Roland. All, any further discussion? All right, none appearing. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Woo